Um, welcome to this very no, no, event. no. Now we're live. You now we're gone. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this very special episode of a uh, roast Google dinner. Um, I'm not your host, James Etock. Uh, with me, or under me, or above me, we've got uh, Joe Amato. He's the one with the modulock mask, the man of mystery. We don't know what he looks like. We got Tyler, whose arms are bigger than most people's legs, the thighs. You know, just seen that man. Um, I, don't, I got, just love this introduction here. This is just really. I'm, I'm winging it. I'm really trying. <laughs> so, sorry. Yeah. And we've got um, Nathan Kennedy, who I don't think I've actually spoke to ever until today. I might be right about that. Yeah, you I you are he, correct. He's there. Yeah, he's there, but he's not doing yeah, his. I, I'm here, but then I won't be here until oh, later. Right. He, he's gonna he's gonna do the old uh, Thanos. And yep. um, I, I'm here in spirit. There I'm we fa go. Yeah. I'm fading away right now, but James, it's nice yeah. to actually speak with you. Yeah, you too, man. Um, yeah, so I'll, I shall hand over to the proper host of Fans of Power, um, Joe and Tyler. Go for it. Well, James, again, thank you for joining us. We always love having you on. And, of course, we got a lot of people who popped up in the chat room. We'll probably be watching and having a lot of questions for you later, too. And as we do at the beginning of the show, we always introduce them before we start firing it up. We have Febmon, Zentron. Uh, I'm we got Grimbot, Willis Wheeler, Zen Brown. Um... I want to see because half the time descendants of gray skull spikes here and that might be okay. And I think that's everybody so far. If I missed anybody, I apologize, but yes, we, we have a lot of different topics today that we're going to want to discuss. Obviously we're going to know, want to know the progress on the return of faker. You got some interesting stuff about he man and the masters of space. You might have some uh, photos or some pictures or some cells and stuff that we've never seen before. And of course we we'll have a commentary, but before we get to all that, Tyler, I'll pass it to you. If you want to say something to James too. I'm just thankful to have James back and uh, he's agreed to do a commentary for an episode. He's already. on and not have to do a commentary with him because I just feel like that's big that needs to be like the staple when he's on is that we always have to do commentary because there's there's still a whole slew of episodes like I have yet to hear James's ver verbal on so just uh um preferably the next time we'll pick something that James has hasn't done a commentary for or something yeah. like that yeah I mean I think most like anything season two is always a uh, a good option I think I don't think I've done many or any season twos. I must have sometime, but yeah. I think you did. You did problem with power and origin of the sorceress, didn't you? Did I? What would that or did look you just, like? Or because I remember you had like a list of like certain episodes from season two just uploaded on your channel, but that was about it. And then you yeah, know, I don't know. It's been so long since the old the, since the old commentary days, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I can't remember really. Have you uh, ever yeah, done yeah. a commentary for the Christmas special, James? You ever do commentary for that? He did, did do I that. Did. Yes, I did, didn't I? I? Yes, on, I have listened YouTube to that. Yeah, channel. yeah, that's right. I was, I was trying to think. Like, there was definitely something out of the. I definitely did something she related, and it was, yeah, it was the the Christmas special. How did I do that? It was like forty minutes. My goodness, and it was just me talking for forty yeah. minutes, which I can do. But about the Christmas well, see, special, yeah, because that's the thing. We know how much you hate it, and uh, I'd love to one time go in depth and wonder why you hate it so much. It's every every Christmas, you know, somebody's well, do either doing that. Or doing... It, Joe, I mean, no, yeah, because yeah, we got we always love digging. That's the thing. That would be a different thing if there was ever something different on a Christmas special of a podcast for fans of power. That would be something. At least it'd be a twist because we've already covered that Christmas special before, and uh, we've talked about other Christmas related things. But maybe one time we'd have to really just dig into you and just get all that hate. A lot of the hate that maybe some fans have never heard before because we know you have to stay <laughs> for a lot of the characters in there, especially the damn man sheens. But I was going to yeah, say, if there's one thing that if there's one thing the fandom is good for, it's hatred. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But um, well, quickly, I did want to say hello to uh, Papa Hood sixty nine. And also, uh, I seen somebody right at the top, uh, Determine AZ. But uh, yeah, I think the first thing that we might as well discuss, or definitely it's going to be you're doing it, uh, is the progress on the Return of Faker cartoon about, you know, when it's going to be premiering. I think some fans know, for those who don't, you can at least get, you know, fill in the details. But that's something a lot of people really want to see. Yeah, um, it's, it's one of those things like, I, th I thought, yeah, I'll give a big update. And I thought, I wonder how long I'll talk about this for. But, you know, it's, I'll probably keep going. Um, yeah, so we've been, me and Dusan, uh, Andrew Kamer, and Yuka Isaacanen, I don't know who you pronounce it, and Keith Seymour have all been working on it. Primarily me and Dusan and Andrew, and Keith's doing effects, and uh, Yuka's been doing color assists on certain sequences. But um, 
Dusan is like, um, uh, uh, I think I've said it before, he's like a crazy machine because the man will, we've got a schedule of like every single piece of animation assigned that we've still yet to do. So since the beginning of the year, I've had this like Google Doc and it's just all the, we need this sequence, we need that sequence, we need this sequence, like, you know, it'll take three days to do this. And I, I give him the schedule hoping that, oh, I hope he hits these marks and stuff. And I'd say 99.8% of the time he's, he's hit the deadlines. And um, yeah, it's amazing. We're entering like, I guess it's the last month of production now in terms of getting the animation together. And the, the funny thing is, um, Maybe so. Let's say at the start of the year, everything was storyboarded except the He Man and Faker fight. So I had everything done apart from this epic fight. I'm thinking, I, you know, I knew what I wanted to do, and, and do so. And I had kind of like thrown around ideas, but it's one thing having these ideas, and it's like, well, how do I actually stage this? How do I incorporate, you know, filmation animation? Um, Joe's frozen. Is he still there? I'm... He's oh, there. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, got, I got worried. Joe was just like. <laughs> you thought, yeah, that was a steal because I look like a piece of paper anyway. He's like, what happened? <laughs> I was like, he's stiller than usual. <laughs> I started to get worried. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was, it was this this idea for the fight. And um, I think it was maybe at the very start of the year, or maybe over Christmas, I just sat down um, and just storyboarded this fight uh, and then kind of put it put the audio and dialogue together and sent off to Doosan. Um, and he was like, oh, it's great. And then I did something in the in the second part of it that I knew he didn't want to do, but I did it. And he was like, oh, I thought we weren't going to do it. And I was like, if I pay you money, will we do it? And he's like, yeah, sure. So <laughs> like, I, gen I genuinely bribed him to do this thing. It's not an awful scene. Like, I've, I've showed it to – I'm not going to spoil it, obviously. Um, I've shown it to maybe one or, one, one or two people that have seen it and gone, oh, my God, you, you, you went there. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I totally did. Um, uh, so yeah, there's that. So that was it. And then I think it was about maybe a month or two ago. I already knew how the episode ended. It's like, this is where the episode ends. And then I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we did this as well? Not like a post Marvel credit scene, but just something oh, like a, a very kind of ending where people will be like, Oh, Oh God. You know? So it's, um, there's, I, I'd say in act two, which is, I think act two is going to be about, 20 minutes or something so it's, it's a 30 minute episode which is like way too long but it's a case of we ain't cutting anything um yeah we got act two and i think act two is going to be yeah roughly about 20 22 uh, yeah i tell you about 20 minutes and it starts off i think anybody watching this is just going to think it's quiet in that you know in that style we love that kind of very paced uh, it's, it's, formation always had a very certain style of pace so like, you know, uh, the story's going like this, but then if, if it was like a, a bar chart or a graph, as it were, it just suddenly goes whoosh, like that. And, and then the last, I'd say about 15 minutes of the episode are just nonstop action. It, it's crazy. It was just, yeah. So. It sounds wonderful. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be, it, it's, it's the one thing I keep telling you, it's not so arrogant. I'm like, no, if anybody dislikes this, they, they, it's them trying to. Per that sounds that sounds so arrogant, but just oh no, I don't like it. It's like why don't you like it? It's like because reasons. And it's like no man, you, you, you're kidding yourself. I know that this is really good. Dusan knows it's really good because you're putting so much love into it. It's a case of you know, it's that thing of oh yeah, yeah, I'm the she, uh, the she <laughs> man, Shira expert, whatever. But it's a case of that that love and that passion, that drive. To, to bring something, again, we're not going to do a half-assed version of it. I'm not going to suddenly have a scene where, you know, it, yeah, He-Man just does something really ghastly, like gets an axe and cuts Skeletor in half. So there's a spoiler. That doesn't happen. There's no, <laughs> there's no murder of Skeletor in this, unexpectedly. Um, and it's that thing of we're just, we, we know what's true to filmation. It's just bringing that back, but bringing it back, at, you know, as, as good as it can be. I mean, the one time... I think it was when I first showed the the scene. I know Joe hasn't seen that. I think Joe's like stayed very spoiler free. Yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, but the, the I've scene, watched everything you've, you've you've shown already. Yeah. Yeah, I can say this, and it's not a spoiler. But the scene where um, the second scene in the episode where Faker meets the evil yeah. warriors. Um, that was good too. And yeah, I mean, in that's um, when I showed that on. I put that on Instagram, and it had all this like amazing feedback. People were like, "This is great!" This is great. And there was just one guy who just said this: "The worst thing he's ever seen." Blah blah blah. And it's always that one person you just think, 
why you mother mm-hmm. and it just it, and it, it, it was just so hate filled and everybody started hating on him so I was like I just need to block this guy but he was mm-hmm. just clearly he just I mean everybody's got a right to dislike something of course but if there's no grounds for it his reasoning was so stupid it was just well, there was no reason he just hated it for hate, the hate sake but when I showed um Act one at PowerCon last year. You know, he had a packed room. I, I can't remember. There was a, a few hundred people in there easily. Uh, st- stood on stage, gave a presentation of like, this is how we've done it, which in itself people had marveled about. And at the end, showed um, all of Act one. And people just the rest of the evening, um, people were just saying the nicest things, got a round of applause. At the end of the showing, there was like about five or six filmation guys there, you know, Rob Lamb, Robbie London, um, Vic Dalchel, uh, Tom Tataranowitz, uh, Ralby Goran, all came up and they were just, they were saying, that was fantastic. How, how? It's like, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was, it was that, that when you get that kind of seal of approval from the, the filmation guys, it's like, yeah, okay, I think, I think we're doing something good here. And obviously it's, it's gutting that, um, like a loose shimer will never get to see it, or even like now, sadly, Larry DeCilio will never get to see it. That's that's really that really sucks. Um, and it's not like even if they had still been with us, it's like, oh, look at this. I'm not expecting them to go, this is fantastic. But it's just, it would have been nice to for Lou to have seen it. Oh, hell, they would have given it like the, the greatest seal of approval, both those guys, especially I mean, I mean, Lou. Like, I think it would have brought Lou to tears to see someone recreate. I know, no, I mean, like, yeah, de- definitely. I think, yeah, you're, you're probably right in that sense. Like, Lee would have been like, wow, blow. <laughs> That's like, it's throwing a curse word in or two. And yeah, he would have really liked it. So, but yeah, so the production is we're, we're finishing the animation. I think it's like, well, we're in now May. So early June, we finished the, all the animation sequences. So that's all done. And then that gives us the rest of June, all of July and the start of August to what we call shoot the, the second act, which is where Dusan puts all these layers and sequences and backgrounds into this program called, I think it's Magic's Vegas. And then he, he shoots it, so he times everything to the dialogue and uh, yeah, puts it all together. Um, I mean, we did act one over the space of uh, so many months, actually about a year act one took, but act two has been done so much faster and yet is way more intricate and detailed and We've been putting in so many Easter eggs and stuff, which I know is a bit of a gimmick sometimes, but you know, in a good way. It, like, that like is, oh, th- this will this will be premiering at PowerCon, though. Is it? Are oh, you yeah, gonna, yeah. Is it it's, trying to or? Oh no, no. It, uh, I, I again, ninety nine point something percent uh, positive that it will, because I've said we're going to do it, and me and Deuce were talking. I think it was yesterday. I said I think it'll take about like you know, 45 to 50 days to shoot Act 2. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, probably maybe even quicker. So I think by early August, we'll have it done. It'll be a huge file. He'll send it to me. I'll take it to PowerCon. I'll play it at PowerCon. And then uh, the, the, this is the thing where we're still, there's still things ongoing. Nothing like, that sounds like, oh, there's a big surprise coming. There's not. But I'm, I'm still hoping between now and, you know, PowerCon and maybe post-PowerCon, that somehow I can get it recognized or oh, all I want. I don't want, I don't want any money. I don't want any of this. All I want is just someone to go, it's official. And there's a big stamp. And you're like, hey, as opposed to you just upload it on YouTube. Everybody watches it and enjoys it and says, oh, it's, it, it's so good. It is official. It's like, yeah, but it would really be nice if one, if, if, if uh, Universal DreamWorks, Mattel, whoever, <laughs> owns um, Hasbro probably these days, who owns He-Man, the cartoon, um, if they could give it the seal of approval. And I'd love them just to distribute it on something. Because I think, I genuinely think that there's enough interest in this from the the hardcore fans, from the casual fans, and from people who just like 80s cartoons. If you said, here's a new episode on DVD or on streaming or on demand or whatever YouTube, Put up a trailer because I've already got a trailer in mind. Um, I think I think you could sell a good couple of thousand units or something. Yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, there's that no is. doubt. I mean, geez, I, what that sounded like a dog barking. But uh, no, I mean, there's no doubt when that's going to be shown at PowerCon. First, I'm going to think. I guarantee people will lose it. So I hope a lot of people at least somehow video. I don't know if there'll be a lot, but I hope somebody of these videos the crowd because I want to see some kind of reaction well, of what people think. 
it's funny you say that. We um, so last year, Daniel Benedict filmed um, every panel. He's the guy that did the Fall of Grayskull film. He filmed full power on every panel, and um, he filmed the my panel where I did the the talk about the, um, how we made how, how we've done the Return of Faker, and he also filmed the the showing of it. But because I don't. I didn't want all of Act One just to randomly go online. I asked them, I said to PowerCon, I said to Val, um, can, can we not put that up yet? So there is an edited version of my panel, which I guess I just haven't, and it's my, it's kind of my fault. I haven't really pursued it and said to them, oh, we should upload it, but please don't upload the episode yet or like the Act One. But I've, I've still got, Dan, I asked Daniel Benedict, I said, can you send me the, because he had, obviously when you film something, you get the audio from the mic and you get the, the background audio from the crowd. So I said, could you send me the camera that's got the audio from the, the crowd sound? And he did. So I mixed it with the, um, uh, the, the, the visual mix he did. And so I've got a, a version of the Return of Faker that I can watch, which has got all the, it's like a audio commentary from the fans. And it's so amazing because I will watch it every once in a while. I'm not like the whole thing, just sit there and be like, I'm so great. But just watch it and just realize, oh my God, this people really, this is just act one. But people really like it. And most of the people in that room have probably seen the first few scenes from Act One. So it's it's not that they're well, this is all new, but they're they're equally enjoying it again. But then when there were a few kind of little moments, especially the, the, the not a spoiler, the transformation sequence that occurs in Act One, because I built that up during the panel. I said, here's how we did it. When we when I finally showed it in the on, in the Return of Faker, people just like it got a huge round of applause, and I was like, "Wow!" I mean, I, you kind of expect that because it's a big transformation on a, a big screen, but to to be in the room and hear that, you know, round of applause and cheers, like, oh wow, we uh, we're doing yeah, something. Yeah, good. That must have been a, a hell of a feeling. I I it mean, was. I couldn't even picture. And, and there was some like unexpected ones, as, you know, in the following scene. Um, Peelers in it, and something happens, and the audience just lost. They, they <laughs> laughed and clapped, and it was brilliant. I was like, I was not expecting that because it was just a throwaway thing that was over the top intentionally, and I put it in there, and people just loved it. And I was like, wow, they really, they really like that. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly think there are two, two to three scenes in Act Two, that, and this, uh, it's not a spoiler, spoiler in terms of if you, if either of you have seen, and I'm not going to spoil this either. If you either either of you have seen Endgame or even a lot of those Marvel movies when those those moments that kind of move you to tears of kind of joy and kind of like oh my god that, that kind of not like this has happened I'm crying because this is sad it's just like you're so overcome with emotion and I think they're like two to three scenes and I think one of them will be the moral segment because it's just so perfect it's so a filmation just so innocent and like oh and you hear Linda Gary who's been dead god uh, 20, what was it, 95, 05, 15, 24 years. And it's her moral, you know, about this episode. And it's um, and it's delivered in that beautiful moral way, you know, the, the head to the camera and everything. Um, and I was just like, when when, when Doosan sent me, yeah, because obviously I haven't been on since then, but before PowerCon, you know, Doosan sent me Act 1. He's like, here it is, you know, because we would go back and forth. He'd send me a clip. And he's like, is this okay? I was like, oh, just that or... Nine times out of ten, Doosan would send me something. Like, oh my god, that's even better than what I storyboarded. Because he's he's got that great mind, like a, a Tom Tataranowitz, where he would just go, "Oh yeah, I see what you've done here, but let's try this." Oh my god, that's great. Um, that's been the pleasure of working with him. It's just you, you have ideas, and that's that's the good the collaboration between us. It's not me and animator guy. It's me and someone who's going, "Well, what about this? And why don't we try this?" And it was it was it's always been a really good collaborative effort. I did this primary storyboard, but he's the one who brings it to life and then says, offers alternatives. Um, but when he sent me Act One just before PowerCon, like obviously I was going over to America and he said, here it is. I took it, I put it on a memory stick and I, I've got like a 50 something inch screen telly over there and I plugged it in. I sat down, I watched it. And after, I think it was about a few minutes into it, I was like, oh my God, I think I'm going to cry. Because it was just, <laughs> it, was, it was that realization of we done something and this was only like i say act one it's 10 minutes it's not it's not gonna blow people i mean act one is is great but it's not the most exciting bits if you know what i mean there's no there's, there's a little bit of action here and there but you're, it's not you're underselling the, that that bit yeah. that's been are you really because i actually just we watched it the other hell i was at the gym am i working and listen and re <laughs> listen re-listen to the the first two parts you learn like god this is awesome like the sound effects and again and can't it's what, what's fun too is is 
trying to catch all the dialogue that I recognize from the variety of episodes that you guys have just spliced together. Like, God, this works perfectly from like Merman's dialogue, Beastman's dialogue, you know, Skel- what Skeletor says. I mean, it's, it, it, hearing Faker talk, like, that's probably my favorite part. You know, it was it's, I mean, it's you, so fun with Faker because you just you just take He-Man dialogue and just try and put it out of context. And with that, you can really create some nasty stuff. And towards the end, like, again, no spoilers, but Doosan came up with an idea. And I think he forgot he suggested this idea with regards to Faker. And I was like, let me put this in. And you, Tyler, you will appreciate it. When you see it, you'll be like, that's from that film. You will totally, and we're not talking about a He-Man movie either, but you will be like, Oh my god, that's amazing! And and I put it when I storyboarded it, and I put it in. And Dusan was like, "Oh my, that's that's perfect," as in exactly how he imagined it. But I think when he suggested it to me, he kind of forgot when I storyboarded. And I thought, put that in because that seems so good. But yeah, like um, it's 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 one project that I just you know things I've been proud of. You know, I've worked on so many He-Man things over the years. Been proud of everything, but the ones that are up there are definitely obviously the. Um, I'm looking at it. That's what I'm looking at. The Dark Horse book, the uh, the Animated Adventures Guide. That was like, oh, my God. You know, that was the book I'd always wanted to write ever since I first started talking about He-Man, on, you know, on the Internet. And then this will, I think, this will definitely go above it because this has been a, a project that's now roughly, I think, three years we've been working on this. We, we you know, we showed Acts 1 and 2 at, um, at PowerCon in 2017. Then act then the full act one 2018 this will be the full thing three you know it's crazy it's, it's been and, it, and it's so funny because at the end of it it's like i i we never went in with any financial gain or anything but it'll just it, but it will be weird when it's like well now what do we do because you, you'll finish it we'll shout a power con hopefully distribute it however that ends up on youtube and then it's like next and well, so I, cool. I, 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 go on. That, that's what I was going to ask you. Am I getting an echo? I feel like I'm getting an echo here when I'm talking. Like, is it? No, no. You... For, for me, it's just you. Okay. No, no, okay. No, I kept um... thinking like I was. Um... Joe, are you getting an Quick, echo? Qu- quickly, just want to let you know. I think that echo pops up when you and I talk on James's ends, and I didn't know if it's because James doesn't have earbuds. Do you possibly have them? Because I think that's what happens. It was when we in- initialize something to say, it does. It sounds like a dog barking, like arf, arf, and oh, yeah, no. that's why I've been let quiet. Me... Let me, um, I've got a pair of headphones. Let me go again. Hang on. I've got okay. A pair of All right. Uh, just Damn. in case everybody was wondering why I was so <laughs> quiet, because everybody's like, Joe's usually trying to, you know, say something or give a point here. And I was just sitting there real quiet. Yeah. It was, it was happening on both our sides there. Yeah, I everybody was knows too that if I keep talking, it's, it's going to sound, you know, muffled for the audience or something like that. Or <laughs> yep. Very disruptive. <laughs> yeah. Cause I wasn't sure if it was all just me. I was going to say, I'm a, oh, hold on. Let's see. I think he's got some headphones. He's going to do something now. Let's see. Hello? Yes. I can hear you can hear okay, it. Hey, yeah. and no echo. There Is you go. Good? All right, James. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right, cool. Good. Cool. I'll have to do it in one ear, otherwise I can't hear my own voice. And I, not because I love my own voice, it's because then I, I sound it sounds weird. It's like when you're talking with your fingers in your ears. <laughs> All I'm right. not really good now at I won't oh, feel so bad. Yeah, I was gonna say now I won't feel bad if I feel like I was cutting you off because I was sitting there wanting to say stuff. I was like, every time I talk, it sounds like a dog barking, so I had to just wait and not say nothing. But no, it's that's the thing about this entire episode. In case, like you said, people wondering, like it it took a long time, but it's because there's a lot of stuff you guys were doing. I mean, you're sitting there reanimating everything. You're adding new stuff. You're doing new pieces of animation. Uh, correct, you are doing. I don't know how much, but you're doing at least little bits of new, unique stuff that maybe we've never seen before. Oh yeah, like um, that's that's the the funny thing is um, primarily we've been doing the uh, you know the, the the stock sequences and this that and the other, but we've also uh, so so much fun. You take sequences from Flash Gordon, Brave Star, um, and Tarzan. You, you'd have to check Dusan in the chats. I'm not sure we we took anything from Tarzan, but okay, um, we've. It's like it's not a big secret because I'll, I'll list it in the credits for the thing. But we've taken animation from shows that aren't even filmation. Oh no, to, kidding! Yeah, I, I found I was again like about maybe a few weeks ago. I, I was sat down watching. Uh, I, I won't spoil it, but I was watching a, an animated film, and I was like, "Ah, oh, these two characters, their physiques are very like filmation." I thought, I wonder if I can. Hmm. And I took the frames. And I drew over them and traced them. 
sent off to do so and he's like oh wow you know he's like that's really going to catch everybody off guard and i was like yeah but it's um i think it works and it really does when we we kind of done a few tests and it's like yeah i think we're onto something yeah because i think the hardest thing to me or at least the most insane thing beyond the animation was just what you know guys were talking about earlier about the voices the thought of you sat there and wrote an entire story had to think of all these pieces of dialogue from all these different episodes to put into one to make a unique episode i mean that just sounds i mean it's so damn difficult but also shows the knowledge that you have of all the stuff but i guess i did have one question is there any unique pieces of dialogue or is every bit of it going to be from all the other episodes i think every i think everything is is it wow yeah, everything is from an episode. Because it's funny now, I've got to the point where when I first started edit, edit, ed, editing it together, I would watch it, but I'd always, I'd always think, you know, Evelyn's plot, Dragon Invasion. I'd always, in my back of my mind, be remembering where the clips were from. But I've, oh, I've watched it so many times now that the dialogue is going to sound so <laughs> arrogant to, <laughs> to a decree. But now the dialogue in it just feels the return of Faker. I, I can't, it's very difficult to me to listen to it and think to myself, where is that from? You know, or, or immediately think, oh, that's from that episode or that's from that. I, I've completely turned it in my brain, all these bits of dialogue into the return of Faker audio. It's really strange. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable because that's what I mean. I thought there would have had to been some point during the writing of this that you would have came up with something that would have been, you know, not in the cartoon that existed. And you would have thought, oh, God, how are we going to voice this or what are we going to do? And the thought of that, every bit of it is used from the cartoon. My God. Like I said, that's, that's amazing. One of my, like, one of my favorite things, um, again, I won't spoil anything, but there's, there's the opening scene at the start of Act 2, um, which I think I uploaded to social media, so Tyler probably saw it. Um, uh, basically has dialogue between two characters and it's about uh, 45 seconds to a minute long and their dialogue is from I think it's 11 different episodes but <laughs> you watch it and you, you really wouldn't know that like people said How, oh was it? I had people messaging me on Instagram especially saying where, where, where how did you do the dialogue and uh, it's like, I, didn't, I didn't do it I just pieced it together but people think you've Someone said, you know, I had a lot of people say, uh, what was the other one? They uh, the common thing was, um, uh, oh, the, the actors sound just like the originals. It's like they are the originals. That's the point. <laughs> they were like, I thought they were. Some of them weren't alive. They must have been yeah, freaking well, out. Like, how did you do that? Yeah. It's, 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 them. I love the idea though that you know it's you do such a convincing job that people think it's either a new episode or an un, you know unreleased or a lost episode. It's like, no, man, this is, you know, this is just a lot of love going into this, which is what's making it, um, you know, so good. It sounds so arrogant when I say that. No, no, no. Um, which I, I wanted to ask you, too, having done this and hoping that it gets a seal of approval by, you know, the people who have the, the rights to the animated series and seeing that new episode, a new episode can be made by just using using the same mindset with filmation, using the same stock stock animation and stuff like that, and you guys using the same audio, I mean, does that open up or ho like the thought cross your mind of like cook, like another episode using types of dialogue, certain action sequences, certain um, pieces of, 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 you know, characters that weren't used as much and, and put them in this episode? Like, does it open up? That, can people look at this when it's done? Like all this was done just from using previous animation. Like this it's, opens it's, up. Like, yeah, it's it's funny. Um, let me give you an answer in a sec. I'm just going to try and replace my headphones with speakers that are just over there because okay. it's like hearing my voice in my ear. I don't know how you do it. It's like all I've got is. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, it's um, my voice that deep. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're live doing this on the fly. <laughs> That's right. We don't claim to be Not a big bunch of production here. This is all just, you know, we're, 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 we're uh, it's all raw. time, but we have a lot of hot. <laughs> all unedited. Exactly. Which yeah. is what you get. I'm trying to you mess up, you screw up. We're going to have this on the podcast. We're going to leave it. So, yeah. So, if okay. you want to watch your mouth, no. <laughs> you know me. Hey, I'm always dropping <laughs> something once in a while. Don't drop, mean to. Uh, an F bomb earlier. I wish James had said it, you know. 
I mean, how, how would that have been? It would have been pure fried gold to hear James yell, "Mother!" You know. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do the. Um, I'm gonna try this audio swap. Okay, hang on a sec. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And are you getting the dog barking? No. No. <laughs> but me and Tyler talked at the exact same time. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yeah, because when you both said no, I was like, am I getting an echo now? <laughs> Is this all good? Is this all working? Yes. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, no perfect. problem. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, yeah, uh, the answer to your question, Tyler, which was, are we going to make more episodes or what What? What? what comes next? Uh, like, possibilities. The funny thing was, I, d I didn't tell Deuce of this, and this isn't like, guess what, we're going to do another episode. Um, I, was, uh, I was playing around a bit of audio, and I realized that if you down pitch Skeletor's voice, you can come with a whole new voice. I was like, oh. So theory is, I thought you could actually, you know, if you took every line of dialogue that Skeletor's had and you down pitch it and it becomes this very dark, you know, guttural voice, I thought, could, could that be another character? Could you, you know, feasibly invent a character and then have a new, you know, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, I'm not I know what you mean. Yeah, so I was, oh, I was wait, like, the dog's oh. barking again. Oh, no, is it? Yeah. Oh, man, hang on. I'll just have to go back to this and just uh, and bear with it. Right, yeah. Here we go. The stuff we put James through, damn it. Cheap headphones. That's fine. <laughs> okay, right, we're back. You don't know cheap till you talk to Joe there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a call. Uh, I used to get $1 ones until Nathan hooked me up with a nice pair, so thanks again, Nathan. But, yeah, it was always $1 <laughs> from the Dollar Tree. lasted two weeks. But go ahead. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um. So, yeah, uh I think it's it's nice. You come up with all these ideas and think, oh, we could. I remember one of the earliest things I said to do, Sam. Um, I said, well, after this, we could feasibly do, you know, the power of the evil horde because you've got all these, um, uh, you know, filmation voices in that that uh, read-along book. But how cool will it be to animate that? But then, yeah, it just becomes like, well, what is the point? You know, it doesn't, not like a defeatist way, but it's like, but everybody but knows that. What if these people see see how great this episode looks? You know, like people that are you know have the rights, they see this, and you want them to see it to give you know give you the the official stamp. If they see that, yeah. like, they could do a whole new episode just using previous animation and splicing things together. Like it's a, essentially kind of a low budget animated series. Like, and you guys not, know I mean, what you're doing. Is that is that outside? Like, you ever thought I about th that? I, th I think that the thing is it's. You know, the return of fake is it is kind of a one off because you can only do so much with that dialogue. You know, you've got 130 episodes and you've got a lot of dialogue. But to uh, create a new episode from existing dialogue, you are limited. Like we couldn't, you know, if, if you said, oh, I'll do an episode about, I'm trying to think. I don't want to say King Hiss because that sounds too predictable, but like a, another character. Uh, well, like Stinkor, like, like I, yeah, I'm like, still very curious about Stinkor being in the series. Yeah, okay, like, so if, if you said, hey, let's do an episode about Stinkor, to find dialogue to suit a story, would, I, I can imagine, it's not a case of, oh, I don't know where that dialogue is, is, but you've got to find characters talking about smell or stench or, you know what I mean? And it becomes it becomes a challenge in that way. It's like, well, how can we tell a Stinkor story about anybody saying, one, his name, or two, the stench of well, evil. Hey, a thought. I mean, this is just a quick random thought. I mean, what if there was just people that wanted to voice for you for free that, you know, did their own unique lines and voices? Would well, that be thing, something like, that you could be open to? I think that's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say no to it. I mean, obviously with the return of fake, it's like, let's just make everything 100% um, uh, genuine. Yeah. Or as, as, as real as possible. But yeah, I mean, like, if down the line someone said here's a bunch of money make a bunch of new episodes then i think at that point you're forced to go okay well we're going to need voice actors you know as simple as that that's that's where you stop being able to um stop being able to pull and pluck from the original series because you, you run out of options really well can you not use shira i mean because i know you mentioned about doing the uh, the power of the evil whore which i feel like you're using at least audio from you know, several Shira yeah, I guess, or, like, or, or I mean, at least there, animation, so to speak. As, yeah, there, you know. there's enough dialogue and stuff from Shira I think you could do something new with. But again, I, th I think you just, with the return of Faker, the kind of the uniqueness of it is, it's how, it sounds weird. It's like, um, 
you could like people have said oh you should do a follow-up with you know it sounds a bit dirty, a bit uh, mundane but you should do a follow-up with anti eternia he man and like i like that character it's like i mean one that's the same staff we're doing another episode about fake he man and also well now i've run out of he man dialogue that sounds bad you know evil he man baddie dialogue so i mean there's the possibility i, I have an idea for another one like a uh, another episode i thought oh, that'd be a great one to do but again i'm like how would i even yeah it's it's finding characters to say certain words uh, like would, certain... would it necessarily even have to be including a new character like why not incorporate triclops more heavily and another evil war no i, I agree i mean like... the problem with the like for example and i know, I know you're using him as an example but the problem with a lot of those characters like if you did let's do a new a new episode about merman with within all those uh, episodes all those unique episodes there's always some piece of dialogue where it's relating to uh let's think the crim uh, the crimson pearl or the, the spellstone or all these specific items or plans of action when you're pulling from episodes it's like well i i need to create the story out of the dialogue and if i've got nothing it's, it's weird it's if you've got nothing new see the, the best thing about faker was you could just say he's a robot he's a robot he's this he's that without having to say his name every single time That's and i'm not just saying about new characters i mean like let's do a, let's do an episode where uh, Trapjaw uh, builds a giant robot to overtake the palace. Oh, that's just not bad, is it? <laughs> uh, but to to do that again, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. But you want there to be dialogue where Trapjaw is saying, "Okay, I've got this plan. I'm going to do this and this." And if that doesn't yeah. exist, then you're like, "I'm really kind of stretching the, the." Like I say, the easiest thing about the the Faker thing is that you're dealing with a robot and a character that looks like He-Man and a character that's actually existed before. So it's there's a level of you can work within that. I think as soon as you step outside, you're like, right, let's try something with a new story about Trapjaw or a new story about Teela. It becomes a bit more challenging. Also, I mean, <laughs> I don't mean to be uh, uh, defeatist again, but I, you know, time <laughs> it's uh, yeah. this has taken three years and yes you build up a um, a stock library of animation but it, and we can always do new animation but now it's like what, what comes next do, do, do we then sit down and go right let's plan this next episode i just don't think either of us i think this is very much a, uh, a passion project that's a one-off but if someone said here's a truckload of money here's a team of people we probably would be like, yeah, sure, why not? But yeah, I mean, guys, you guys are only a four-man crew compared to Jesus back in the day. I mean, think oh, of the God, amount yeah. of people that animated. It's like it, that's the thing a... is, it, it's crazy. Like, um, you know, there were more blooming people in their special effects department than we've got in the entire thing, and it's um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But I, I, it's one of those things where I, I've no, I've no doubt that if we did another one, it'd be equally as good. I think in a way it'd be it'd be much harder to do just because the faker story it's going to sound really weird is easy to tell oh that makes sense because it's it's quite like I'm not going to spoil anything for joe but the story is so basic when you look at the faker story it's the 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 beauty of it is one it's the faker we've never seen it's the you know the cross-sell art faker but also it's um it's the, the 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 weaving of the dialogue is primarily how that works in the visuals but the story is your basic start middle and end when you look at it it's, I'm, yeah, again, you picked but what you did if you did oh god i'm hearing the dog barking again i'm sorry mm -hmm. um no but what you guys what you yeah what you guys did though was you picked the perfect character because you picked a cult character the mm -hmm. amount of love and in not only in art but in customs that i've seen on facebook instagram for faker i mean it's just it's overwhelming so you pick the perfect character but also within telling a story where finally get you know we get to see the faker that people wanted to see in the cartoon yeah. which is going to make them happy i think it's just going to show that once at PowerCon, and this i don't know if you guys eventually release on youtube however things will work but once it starts going around the entire you know internet and everywhere in social media 
I think it'll it'll get the word out that fans do love this and want this, and it'll show this is something they're claiming for. This is something they love, and they would definitely back if you know, like you said, there was a budget and they made more episodes. But either way, if that could have been put to somehow to be you know for sale, which I know, like you said, there's reasons you can't sell it, but just if there could have been a way, like you said, a, a joint uh, partnership or something to have that for sale for people, and then for them to thank God, fans would like to see more of this He-Man that shouldn't be mocked because what's on fortunate is a lot of the stuff that i see on youtube i'll see a lot of videos to where they'll try to copy the filmation style and it's all in part of making fun and poking fun at he-man unfortunately but the thing that's sad is all these views i'm like god if people are looking at these stupid mocked videos of filmation he-man what do you think they would think to see a real episode of filmation masters of the universe done proper that's the funny thing, like, it's going to sound, this is this is a, a peek behind the curtain I don't think we've ever said, but, um, well, firstly, I'll, I'll go to your point. You're right, that post-PowerCon, my, my kind of idea is maybe before PowerCon, like a month, if there's time, we put a trailer up and put it on social media. And I think based on the most recent clip we put up, which uh, scene, which was the opening of Act 2, that got so much positive response. There was just no negativity. That the only negative comment, I, I, I can't say because it, it might spoil it for Joe, but it was just like, oh, <laughs> the hair's not moving. And I was like, that's because they use really good hair product in Eternia. You know, I was just mocking. It. I was like, <laughs> Who the hell takes time to like, oh, uh, I, 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 I must let James know. You know, it's, uh, oh, it's, it's just like, you know, you know, he was just. I think he was being uh, facetious, but I was like, oh, so, you know, I'll, I'll be like, yeah, whatever. But um, uh, yeah, so I think. I think you're right in the sense of social media will give it the traction that me just maybe uploading it to YouTube wouldn't. Like I'll definitely put the trailer on YouTube and I'll definitely put it on Facebook and Instagram and hopefully that will generate something. Maybe like hashtag <laughs> uh, universal make this or something. I don't know. Yeah, um, I like that. But, but uh, the thing is interesting and I, I Actually, I don't. It's not a big secret. I don't think Dude would mind me saying this. He's probably sitting there going, "What's he going to say?" Um, is um, we? I mean, first off, when I when I storyboarded the, the story, like in my brain and speaking to Dude we always took it hundred percent seriously. Like the Skeletor in this, while there are moments where he's that comedic one, most of his dialogue is like serious. He rarely ventures into you bumbling oaf and any of that stuff. It's 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 pretty like dragon invasion skeletal diamond ray skeletal that that one ah, yeah if he might throw out the odd insult but there's there's it's not that you know you broke my staff kind of thing from season two where you're like oh man no um <laughs> uh which was uh, that's no, a, I, I love his dialogue in particular when you know obviously joe like faker gets <laughs> introduced to everybody at certain at one point and I just love Skeletor's dialogue and his animation of like commanding what he wants. Like I, that's one of my favorite parts of that sequence. And like, cause that's... I, I didn't like it when, when Doosan did like, we, we obviously had that sequence you're talking about when Doosan put that in, I was like, I said, Oh, I, I don't feel like we need that. And he's like, no, no, we'll include that. And I was like, okay. And then it totally works. Cause people, people love that, that, that command as it were, it's yes. so dramatic. Um, and it, yeah, it totally works. But yeah, I mean like, Hopefully the the trailer will get traction, and then um, yeah, from there. Like, wait, are you going to play like an epic trailer music, or we play the formation like Shuki Levy? It will definitely be music. Just, uh, like, I had an idea for a trailer. I haven't even told you, so I wrote it down. But um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a really it will be a really good trailer. It won't be long, and but it, and it will be Avengers Endgame in that it won't rev it won't try and show off too much good stuff because I want surprises in this. Because that's the problem. After PowerCon, I'm going to say at PowerCon when I show it, one, please don't film it and stream it. Just please. And also, two, if you can, don't spoil it for people. Because, I mean, I get that social media is a very tricky thing and this isn't the level of end game. We're not that important. But in the terms of the He-Man community, it'd be really nice if every time someone watches this, they're like, oh, wow. Because, yeah, there are I keep saying there's like two or three scenes. There's about four or five scenes in Act Two, which will blow people's minds. Um, uh, to the point where I'm telling you this, and Dusan probably knows certain ones, but he's not sure about the specific ones because I there is there are so many in that little in that that second act. Um, but yeah, going back to what I was saying before about uh, 
peeking behind the curtain and taking this seriously. It's got to the point, and it's sad, but what Joe was saying like goes back to that, where certain things we've storyboarded or animated, we're second guessing at times. Nothing story changing, nothing game changing, but I'll have a shot of, and you know where I'm going to say it's like Faker, no, he, he man grabbing Faker from behind. And do says like, what are we going to do when? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I mean, I want to put this scene in and I think we should, and we probably will. But I, I remember the first time we uploaded uh, the opening, the first scene of the, of the Return of Faker. I'll try to remain spoiler free for Joe here. You can speak in code because I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So when when um when Faker first uh, is awakened, <laughs> the awakening of Fakening, when Faker first is awakened, you get that. Uh, it's not a massive spoiler, Joe. You get a point of view shot. Oh, hey, I'll wait, tell you yeah, what. Look, beautiful. look. I'm gonna take out my earphone, and when you're done doing the spoiler, just I'll put your thumbs up. I'll give you the finger there, Joe, to let you know. Hey, there, there. Yeah, give me a middle finger. Whatever you guys. I don't know what you guys think. You'll be a, talking about me right Joe's now. handicap here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. He's he's so now he's in the uh, in that zone. So the scene where Faker gets up and he walks across to Skeletor, and he's got the point of view, and you see Skeletor walking towards Faker, and then Faker bows. He gets like the Skeletor says, "Bow before your master," or "Kneel before your master." And Faker walks across, and you get the point of view where he goes he goes down. And we noticed, well, like one of the first comments, not the first, but one of the comments I remember when we first saw that scene was someone said, Congratulations, it was so pathetic. It's like, congratulations, you managed to make He-Man the cartoon even gayer than it really it originally was. Oh, I'm like, God. Do you see sexuality in everything? Like a character kneeling in front of another character. We can't do that anymore because that's that's a, 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 a wanton act of homosexuality. It's, it's ridiculous. And I, I just, and it gets to the point of annoyance because, and I've said this publicly recently, I hate it because there's a level of he man is gay and it's not done as humor. It's, it's done using homosexuality as an insult. And that's the thing people seem to fail to realize. I'm like, you don't, you don't see what's going on here. This is like a, a passive form of um, homophobia. I honestly believe that. If I said, oh, that, that drawing of so-and-so look is gay, and it's like, okay, but why are you saying it? It's like, because I'm trying to bring it down. It's like, well, by bringing it down, that means it's lesser. So anyway, that's another discussion for another but, time. Well, I mean, but, I, but I'm, I'm glad because I just feel like there may be get you may get some of the you know kind of remarks like that once this thing comes out and i i feel like that's something that i i don't feel like has been addressed that much because it's it's an it's it's like a germ that's spread all over social media like yeah. and that's why and i worry about times, e-man in general is looking yeah, there, as a gay times, joke yeah there are times um when you can i i the, one of the first things one of the first kind of parody he-man videos i saw on the internet was a flash video so that tells you how old it is <laughs> and it was a he-man is gay thing but do you know what? It was funny and it was done with love. And it was about, it was like a VH1. Do you remember that behind I, the music? Yeah, I love the, I love the 80s. Yes. And I remember, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know it first aired. I don't, I, no, I'm not talking about that. I know the one you're talking about. This was um, uh, like a flash video just on the internet. And it was basically like He Man converting Castle Grace into a disco and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And it, it, and it was very, it was very like He Man is Gay, but it was, it was, it was funny and it was well done. And I was like, oh, I like that. That's fun. It wasn't hurling insults to raise someone else. It wasn't like, he man's gay because, you know, I'm up here and I can point downwards at it. And it's just the, you know, the video we're all going to talk about. It's, I, I, I don't get it. I just don't get that video. Why it's so hilarious. It's, um, yeah, I don't know. So my point is, um, we can bring Joe back actually. Joe. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's back. Okay, I'm back. He's back. Um, yeah, so I was, I was I'm just talking to Tyler, just saying with, with the return of Faker, we're just kind of tiptoeing around because we don't want people just throwing, this is gay, that's gay, look at that, this, that, because it just becomes like, why, why are you just throwing shade on our work? And, it, and it's not done, it's not done lovingly. It's not done, it's done as, a, as an insult. And I just, I just find that really frustrating. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I really don't no, think you're not. I'm, I'm on the same boat with you. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm fed up with, what, go ahead, Joe. 
I didn't want. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. But are you saying is that what people were saying about your trailer you did, or you said something else where there was something? No, no. There, there was missed. one. There was one shot in um, the opening scene of Return of the Faker where someone just said, um, "Oh, this was the line." He said, "Congratulations, you've made uh, he, the He-Man cartoon gayer than it ever was." I'm like, "But you're the way this person was doing it. it that's just an in, that's an insult. That person is using homosexuality as an insult." And I'm like, "Yeah, do you not see Which what they should?" Yeah, no, right, like, and that's something they shouldn't do. Because I, I tell you what, that's that was an example. That's one of the things that I was saying where I seen on uh, YouTube. It just popped up in news feed the other day, and somebody tagged me, and it was He Man. Apparently, um, uh, uh, Prince Adam is standing in front of uh, Queen Marlene and King Randor, and Man at Arms is there, and they're talking about um, a bunch of people that are going to be invaded with big uh, bulging muscles or something. And Prince Adam is supposed to be, I guess, getting excited about it. He's like, um, I think He-Man's needed. And then He-Man shows up. And they're like, yeah, there's a skull face and he's got bones too and, and, and but big muscles. And you're right, they're doing this as like, you know, an insult, you know, which again, there is nothing wrong with anybody being gay, but they're not doing it. They're doing it in a way to, to make it an insult where why are you doing this to like mock or be mean to people? That's not something that's funny at all. And uh, yeah, that's what I mean. That's what we're seeing on YouTube. It's like, but why, why are you doing that just to get clicks and views? Yeah. I don't get it. Of course it is. It's the funny thing is I could do a video, you know, as, as I've shown with the return of Faker, I can edit dialogue very well. I could easily do uh, a video that maybe who knows these days could become a meme where I could have characters talking to one another like they want to fuck the shit out of one another. <laughs> I could do that. I, sure. could abs- I could absolutely do that. The point is, I don't want to because one, well, it's not. there's no level of creativity there. I'm also like, why? Why, why do I want to? I mean, okay, yes, I'm the person that is the last person to do it because I like the cartoon. Um, it just, it just it frustrates me when people try and turn something it's something it's not and i'm i'm, I'm right. talking about anything like oh sure um, yeah like you know it, it, oh I, i'm gonna say this about the cartoon uh, blah 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 and it's like no no you're you're, you're reading too much into that um, well hell what you're saying right there it's almost like the people who back in the day read too much into the cartoon saying it was about devil worshiping and evil which of course changed the landscape of the cartoon there you go that's exactly it it's, it's the same thing um but yeah so kind of bringing it back uh what I'm really hoping for the return of Faker is just it goes out and people, one, you're going to have the fans that go, this is awesome. Hopefully casual fans will be like, this is really good. I, I, I'd love, I really love it to get traction where you get, it gets picked up by who knows, like the odd website here and there where someone goes, these few fans made something pretty amazing. And that would be it, to get it where people are watching it going, oh, this is really good. It's it's taken itself very seriously whilst also giving a little wink to the audience about this was fun. Remember how fun it was as opposed to. Isn't that what it usually takes? You know what you just said there. Isn't that what it usually takes? It takes the passionate fans, the ones who really love the property who show all the, the effort and everything to make something great that everybody loves and remembers like that to where they're now wanting more. It's like, this is not it, it. Like I said, this is just me giving an example, but like when, the Curse of the Three Terrors was first shown. And I remember the fandom was going insane because anywhere you linked, people were saying, yeah. He-Man's coming back. It looks like they're See, just that. The buzz was continuing going crazy. And then when they seen it, there were some people said, oh, the animation looks weird. Oh, this is going to be a terrible cartoon. And everybody's like, no, this isn't supposed to be an actual new cartoon series. Just, this was a quick work, cartoon. But, yeah. Right, an advertisement for the figures, and it was just a yeah. quick little, sh- you know, cartoon short, which they didn't understand. But within that little bit of a short, it showed the buzz because it spread not only into He Man oh, pages, yeah. but the '80s pop culture and everywhere. And to think that yours is a true one that's going to look like the cartoon, people are going to lose their shit. I mean, that'd be amazing. Like that's the thing. I, I would love it to get that kind of attention where people are like, like I say, I think. The, the one time this happened was many, many years ago. Um, me and this guy in Canada um, created like a pitch, a real uh, a, 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 a pitch to IDW for a Ghostbusters comic because I've been doing a Ghostbusters comic. And I said to this artist who'd been working with me on Serial Geek, I said, why don't we do this? Um, why don't we do a pitch? I wrote a script. I storyboarded the thing. He illustrated it with his magnificent art. We sent it to IDW. The comic company and they said we're not, no, we're not really looking to do this 
okay, fine. Uh, the artist said to me, should we put it online? I was like, yeah, sure, let's put it online. We put it online on DeviantArt. It got traction. It got covered by the New York Daily News, um, <laughs> loads no of way. websites. Yeah, it got, it, got, it got huge traction. And, um, and with that, the Ghostbusters comic got a new lease of life. I wasn't involved in it, unfortunately. I got to write one Ghostbusters story, which was pretty cool. But, um, yeah, I truly believe, like, that was an example of, oh, these fans, they can do a really good job. Let's bring them in. And I would love with this, this the return of Faker, that it gets, yeah, just people kind of go, oh, my, this is something really special. Why don't, maybe there's something we can do with this. Like if you're talking about the, the important people at Mattel or Universal, DreamWorks, Classic Media, whatever they, they're called these days, to have them go, maybe there's something here. Because I, it, I don't mind uploading it to YouTube and everybody gets to see it, but it would be really nice to have it, you know, the, the tape ribbon cutting ceremony, something really kind of special. And people are like, wow, this is, because like I said, with the trailer, I really kind of want to, I, I know the kind of trailer I've got in my mind. And I'm thinking with just the trailer alone, I think we could really make people go, oh, wow. Because you just include a few really amazing pieces of animation um, coupled with a nice uh, narrative. And I think, I truly think the the trailer alone will make people go, wait, what's this? You know, and I think, yeah that would be nice if that gets attention from the important people but yeah so um in short <laughs> return of faker is going well i i really well, think that, 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 that this is what he-man really needs though it needs to have a a heavy presence like this to get people to shut the hell up and stop carrying on like at least with casual fans and, and thinking it's funny and you know fisto home you know homosexual references and stuff like that you know something like this comes along and shows you this stuff's taken seriously. This stuff was 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 never meant to be laughed at and made fun of. It's probably from some asshole who never grew up with it. It's like, oh look, a guy in purple tights. Oh, I'm, it must be gay. But something like this comes along. I feel like it's going to change perceptions for a lot of people. Like I, the hardcore fans and, and even casual fans that are on a lot of the Facebook. I think they're going to love it. He meant or people are going to love it. I, I just feel like this is the kind of thing people need to see to like. Oh, holy shit, dude! Like there's this, like the trailer alone. Like I could picture like the the, the track he meant he meant to the rescue, which is my by far my favorite track, playing up and just playing like images quickly, just playing up how serious this this mythology and this content was always meant to be perceived, and bringing it back to the forefront, to like to the masses. Like this is what it's all about here, people. It's no, it's not a joke. It's not pointing and making fun of homosexuality. It's about classic barbarians and, and sword and sorcery and demonic villains kicking each other's asses and telling a fun story at the end of the day. I just this it's a good shot in the arm because I I'm worried about the movie being shit. So seeing something I, I, like this coming I out think, and I don't think we have much to worry about the movie in terms of I don't think they will look at the comedic perception of He Man and think oh maybe we should tailor. I think they're just going to do their own thing very much like I've no involvement or any acknowledgement or any knowledge of anything. But I think they're just going to do their own thing. And whatever that is, we'll either like it or dislike it. I think it's yeah. that simple. I don't, I don't, I think um, they'll, you know, not to get into another a movie discussion, but I think they'll um, look to what the fans like, um, hopefully, and, and look to what made the show a success. Like the, the genius of the Marvel films on the whole is worked in the 60s okay why don't we keep doing that why don't we use what why don't we use that template that stan lee and jack kirby and all those guys used where you do all these stories and they build to something and there's continuity and there's all this stuff and you keep those characters true to themselves and yeah there's an argument where you know someone like thor who i i, I was the thought i was i am a thor purist but i kind of like the direction they went especially with the the end game. It's like okay, that's different. Um, you you were game, you were cool with that? Yeah, like um, <laughs> we're going to go to a discussion here about that. <laughs> but um, like I um, I was a huge Thor fan, like especially the Kirby days and the Walt Simonson in the eighties when he did the whole um, Serto with the giant sword and destroying the Rainbow Bridge and all that amazing stuff. When um, I I can understand the shift they took with Thor. I, I really, I did like that, especially in Endgame, the, the way that story arc ended. It's like, I can see the journey he's made. Because Thor was always this person, who's this character who has all this kind of bravado 
but he's like a little boy. He's got no confidence. And I think, as in, you know, he's, he's always the unworthy son and all this business. But I, I like the fact he's, he went into that weird place in Ragnarok, which I think a lot of that, his character was influenced by every, all the events around him because it got crazier and crazier as the thing went on. And then, like, come Endgame, you see the result of his failures and his inability to connect with certain people. And then his story reaches a conclusion. But, sorry, with the, with the He-Man movie... Um, yeah, I just think they'll do their own thing. So long as the only thing that they need to get right <clears throat> is He-Man, he his true character, is as simple as that. And you, you'll know the line straight away. It's like, I, I only fight when I must. And each time, I hope it is the last time. Because that's perfect. You've got this man with all this fuck off power. And he's like, yeah, but I don't want to beat up a tree or I don't want to do this. I don't mind the odd bit of tree slang in a movie, you know, if he's got to get through a dense forest. I, yeah. I, I would love, for me, the ideal He-Man movie is a mix of those seven DC comics, visually, you know, when it's the Mark Texier era. Um, I, I think it's pronounced his surname. Not the first four, where he builds a house with his fist. Yeah, the ones that got Triclops and Trapjaw. Yeah, you know, when, just, when, yeah. You know, the terror of tri uh, yeah, when they introduce those characters, and, they, and that's a story arc, they build it. And I, I love those mini comics. They're my favourites. Have that with the heart of the Formation cartoon, and I think you've got something. I don't, I don't you know, yeah, get an Orco in there, have the character, have Battle Cat talk. I think to not have Battle Cat talk is a massive error because you take out that, not Batman and Robin, but that sidekick camaraderie. Yeah. The, beauty, the beauty of having Battle Cat is He-Man can bounce off him and not stand there and go, what is this I'm looking at? Because he can say, Battle Cat, what do you think? You know, that kind of thing. Um... Yeah, so yeah, sorry, we've kind of gone off subject, but He-Man movie, I, I've, I've, I've got high hopes just because I, I, I think they're looking probably, hopefully, looking at stuff what works in the current cinema. My, my fear is that they would think, sword and sorcery, Game of Thrones, let's just do that, let's make it all bleak and dark. That would be a mistake because if you're going to entice people with a He-Man movie, it needs to be. It needs to have that fantasy element, but it needs to have colour and it needs to have heart and pop from the screen. It needs to distinctly be something that has never been seen. For me, the, the closest thing to a He-Man film visually was probably Thor Ragnarok because you've got all these bright colours, all these amazing buildings and structures. Um, it's just a visually gorgeous film. Um, so I'd love it if they kind of went that way. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess we'll wait and see. I, I don't believe it's going to come out next year. I mean, there's always talk of it's coming out next year. It's like, no, it's not. This with, yeah, what, what are you making this with like $40,000 uh, 40, $40, budget? You know, um, and, uh, you know it's, uh, I, I guess well, it's one of those things that I, I, I like Joe, I've always said, I, I will start getting excited when I see that first picture from production, whether it be man in costume. Man, I don't want to see some bloke pointing at a laptop screen going, look, we're doing this drawing of the character. Because <laughs> that's bullshit. That's, that's, that doesn't tell me anything. I can do that. I can get a photo of me. Look, look, I'm working on a He-Man film. It's exactly. Until then, I'll just keep my, yeah. I'll keep my meme ready at all times, yeah, ready to update time. that year, oh, every wow. single year. But, uh, well, before we go to our ne next subject, which will be uh, – well, first um, – when is it going to be uh, showing its debut at PowerCon? You might as well let everybody know. I can't remember the exact date for Return I can't of Faith. Exact date myself. Um, I do have something. Hang on a sec. I'm just looking at my bookmarks here. Bear with me. Okay. I've got something. Oh, no. This is where I can't find it. Uh, is this it? No. Oh, I know. I know I'm doing wrong. Sorry. <laughs> this is great television. <laughs> um, me. Oh, God, that's where the internet doesn't work. Come on. This is great. I like it. Oh, you're putting him on the spot. I love this. Way to let Val and everybody down. Good job, James. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> um, it's um, sometime in, in summertime. Sometime this year. That's amazing. Um, yeah, let's, let's just go to... It's August like 17th and 18th or something like PowerCon. Is that what you're saying? right, yeah. Yeah, because oh, I couldn't remember which day you were. Yeah, if it was, the, you know, like Tyler said, the seventeenth or the. Well, gonna, I'm sure it'd be yeah. Saturday. I, I could see it's, James doing this on a Saturday. Saturday, the seventeenth of August. So that's when it will be. Oh, okay. I hope that's right. Yeah, Saturday, the seventeenth of August. About I think 
night we haven't finalized it with val but like nine or ten o'clock in the evening because that's what time it was shown last year and luckily everybody sticks around and it's you've got a good um nobody's like caught up with looking around tables or doing panels everybody's just there to see that that um oh, awesome. that cartoon well, can't wait for it. And I was just giving you some shit there. No problem. But uh, <laughs> now we're going to move on to something that a lot of people maybe have never heard of. And I can't wait to see what you got to say, if there's going to be a thing you're going to show. But, but it's uh, Filmation's unproduced He-Man and the Masters of Space. you got to let us know about this for people that don't know. Okay. So um, I think it was, it was a good 10 or so years ago, maybe a bit longer, um, where there was this collector who's sadly no longer with us, a guy called uh, Darius uh, Darius Golden, I think was his surname. But Darius, like, he was one of the first people that um, had access to Lou Scheimer. Lee Clevenger was the first. He would always, you know, hang out. Or hang out. <laughs> he would he would uh, bump into Lou Scheimer at the most interesting places, but also see him around the area because Lee lived in the in the valley where, where Lou lived as well. So we'd bump into him and stuff. And Darius was one of those who was like a big fan for much. Him and his sister Darianne, and they would. Um, they would go to lose. They they met John Irwin numerous times. They were like super fans. But Darius collected so much uh, animation art. But what he got, because he was really early in the door, like Lee, he managed to get like a lot of good stuff. And he was getting, um, yeah, just a lot of development artwork. And what he found was this stack of papers from um, a filmation pitch. Uh, not even a pitch. That's probably the wrong word. It was something that was in production called He-Man and the Masters of Space, <clears throat> which was Filmation's, you know, they've been speaking to Mattel, Mattel said, here are these figures we're going to do. And Filmation were like, okay, let's turn these into, um, it's clearly, you know, it had worked for them before, let's do it again. So in, I think it was early 1989, like first few months, because Filmation closed their doors in, was it February 1989, I think? So literally the first couple of months of 1989 saw Filmation develop He-Man and Master Space. So Darius had acquired Ooh. these, not scripts, but like a series Bible, then another revised series Bible. And it was, I, I spent a long time trying to figure out where everything was because basically what happened was it was kind of sitting in Darius's collection, not doing much. And then Emiliano uh, and the, 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 found, the Power of the Honor Foundation bought it and Emiliano just scanned it all in. It was like, can you make sense of this? And I was like, I'll give it a shot. So <laughs> went, through it, went through it all and uh, yes, read it and thought, wow, this is really very different. And because Dusan was saying to me uh, today, oh, you're going to talk about Masters of Space. I was like, it'll be tricky because all the paperwork, one, it's all on my desktop, as in it's all on my computer, but also it's all jumbled up. So in other words, you'll read, and, you'll read one version and then there's another version where the ideas clash. So what I did a few years ago for, um, I wrote an issue, uh, uh, an article for Serial Geek, issue 14, there's a, there's a plug for you. And I wrote this article about He-Man or the Masters of Space. So what I'll probably do is kind of um, read from it as best I can. That's okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Bring it on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try the, uh, sorry about this. I'm gonna try the speaker option once more. <laughs> Just because the uh, the vibrations are killing my eardrum. <laughs> so if the barking dog happens, let me know. Woof. Um, so yeah. So I'll just show, I'll show I'll show the article. Um, so this is what it, this is. How many pages is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One. So Ten page article. <laughs> That's a, well, I had a lot to work yeah. with. There looks like. Oh, there we go. You see that now one? is that yes, I love that. Image. Is that something that was just kind no, of as like you know? I didn't have these speakers on. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to I ask you about the image real quick. Like, is that an image that was put together by a, a fan, like a rendition, including like the NA look, or is this what Filmation was going for? Like this. So that's that's Filmation's. It was like a, a promotional sale. So yeah. they had the right date on it and everything. The the background and the space, and, and if you look, you can see the original um, He-Man in the background there. That oh, was, okay, uh, yes, yes. That was, that was me doing a bit of Photoshop wizardry because he just looked a bit lost on a bit uh, a, a white background. Um, but yeah, that's He-Man and Skeletor. 
Hello, that's, I mean, I don't think the face is quite there, but again, I think it was just for promotional purposes, but that was their skeleton. Okay, because I want to say, I thought I had seen these images online before, and to see them in this article, I thought they were just, you know, someone had just kind of decided to do um, oh, no, no, there wasn't like filmation the, the, versions of it, as opposed to... From filmation's production. Um, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll read this as best I can. I do that, it's this preface where I talk about... Uh, um, you know, the toy, the He Man toy line that died, the original one. So Mattel were going to do the, the He Man in Space idea. And the fact that uh, Mattel and Filmation had, you know, worked together for so many years on He Man. And it had been, obviously, it had been a really good relationship because they'd done, you know, the Filmation He Man. And then when She Ra came along, that was very much a co production where both Mattel and Filmation were working on these characters, bringing together, you know, bringing about Hordak and the Evil Horde and She Ra. You've seen. Online, probably all those sketches of various sketches. I think Doosan's posted a lot in the, um, I forget the name of the Facebook group now, the Archives of Grayskull, maybe. Where Is it the ancient, uh, the ancient the library of? Yeah. Ancient library. I just went, that's it. And I pointed to the speaker like you were over there. I was like, yes, Joe, you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's that there barked again, just to let you know. But go ahead. You're good. You're good. Um, yeah, so, okay, this, so I've got like the text from, um, I, I copied a lot of the text from the thing. So it's not like I'm making this up. Uh, trust me, I'm not making this up. There are some things in here that <laughs> we're not going to have... about what's coming here, the way James is saying this already. <laughs> no, no, don't worry, we're not going to have hero and the land of legend levels God, of goofy. I, hope not. I mean, like, there's, no, yeah. there's nothing that looks like a penis in here. So we're, that um, was a fucking doozy. That, yeah, that yeah, was something yeah, else. Yeah, well, there's nothing like that. There's going to be nothing where, you know, everyone's losing their shit. It's, uh, this is, I mean, it is pretty basic, but it is interesting. So bear in mind, obviously, what the new adventures became. Um, you know, it was obviously jet lag via Deke, I guess. Um, what the new adventure of He-Man was, very different show from, you know, starts off on Eternia, but then ends up on Primus, and it's very different. So here we go. <clears throat> so uh, the series, this is from the series Bible. Um, the series follows the adventures of Adam, now Commander Adam of the Starship Eternia, and He-Man as they travel through deep space to com confront the revitalized evil of Skeletor. At Adam's side is famil familiar comedic figure of Orko. In front of him is the console, RAM, R-A-M, as in, you know, random access memory, I think was the term. So RAM, a control board directly res responsive to the electrical energy in Adam's brain. So much so that it can creatively, it can create visual holograms and voice projections of Adam to account for his absence when he transforms into He-Man. Okay, so in other words, when he's off doing He Man, Ram will go like, There's Prince Adam. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, in his scabbard is a new sword with amazing powers. Oh, this is the sword. I can't wait to. Here we go. This is where the sword comes in. You ready for this? In his scabbard, right, in his scabbard is a new sword with amazing powers, not all of which it shares with Adam, for it is a talking sword. Oh, shit. <laughs> Hey <laughs> right, James, I, I thought you said this shit wasn't going to be as bad as Hero. Here we fucking go again. God, God almighty. Does it sing? Oh. That's I'm thinking of think... singing sword and Roger Rabbit. With... Yeah. <laughs> my attitude oh, is, I always, I always said to do so. And I, I, no, I would actually do this with my friend Lee in America. I said, I can imagine if they did a sword, a talking sword, and I love formation, I guarantee it would have been like, um, Zagras would be like, oh golly, he man, you know, and you're like, oh, oh. that kind of shit. Like, oh, oh god, god, yes, yeah, and I could see that too. Yeah. Oh man. So anyway, he's got a talking sword and one that doesn't. This is the, this is the where it gets bad, and one that doesn't hesitate to express its own short-tempered desire for immediate action. Ram's philosophy is take immediate. Oh, sorry, Ram. Ram. So the computer's philosophy is to take immediate impulsive action with. Uh, a darn the consequences attitude. He is not always pleased with Adam. Oh, this is the sword. Hang on, sorry, I'm getting lost here. Um, Me blah, too. Blah, blah. Oh, anyway, so yeah, the sword sucks. Um, aided by a brand new, group, <laughs> aided by a brand new group of power heroes, including Darius, Hydron, and Flipshot. Okay. Adam, man, and the fantastic Starship Eternia roar through a series of high action adventures that will take them through time and space across the frontiers of the universe. So, uh, and this is me talking now. Um, uh, aware of the basic 
premise of He-Man and Skeletal Fight in the future, one of the first things Filmation did was flesh out the colourful cast of characters that existed within the Triax star system. Uh, a meeting was held, I was pretty good at my research, a meeting was held on the 18th of January 1989 at Filmation in which a group of creatives began working on the individual, individual personality traits of the characters. Bear in mind, this meeting is held on the 18th of January. Formation closed their doors on February the 3rd. Oh, this, is, this is like two weeks' work. Um, so close to that, that sword. This idea fucking closed their doors, I think. That might have been it. <laughs> They're like, oh, God, we got Kit and the sword now. It's like Knight Rider. What the hell's going on? <laughs> They're like, we're done. Close the doors. <laughs> L'Oreal will be the like, uh, I think they're French company. What, what ideas are you come up with? And they're like, He Man and the Talking Sword. They're like, Close this company. <laughs> exactly. Close it now. Throw the papers. So that's why you have them in scattered order. The papers got thrown up, half got missing and lost. They don't even know what they have. Oh, keep going, James. This is. Uh, uh, the fact, the idea that the sword kills Galatia. <laughs> You oh. need to draw that, draw up this talking, dancing star, the thing that killed Filmation. Jesus. Like just like stuck right through the Filmation logo, just like jam right, right through the heart <laughs> of Filmation there. Oh, Jesus oh, Christ. Oh, I'm sorry, it does get worse. I just remembered. Okay, we're not there yet. Oh, it does. Man, man. <laughs> um, I, just, I was just like, oh, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, so anyway, so 18th of January 1989, um, Filmation creators began working on the individual personality traits of the characters. The character descriptions of both He-Man and Skeletor are ours to be expected and differ very little from what Filmation had established. Prior to Filmation's involve involvement, Mattel had loosely established three allies for He-Man and two henchmen for Skeletor. So basically, um, yeah, we've got, we've got Darius, Flipshot, Hydron, Flog, and Slushhead. So no, 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 you know, we, we know all about that there. Oh, but yeah. no, I'm saying that, but Darius obviously wasn't in the new adventures, was he? Darius was an action figure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah didn't he just pop up in like the UK stories or something? The UK or... Books, yeah. 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 The, those, those, um, they were the German stories that I think the UK translated. Ger yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because, um, Darius came out as a figure, didn't he? he, came... he no, yes. uh, not in the States. For I classic. think he was released as a prototype. Oh, yeah, just a prototype, yeah, but we got him just in classics. Yeah, yeah, we just got to see that. Oh, yeah, exactly. I was always a bit unsure about him. So anyway, Darius is Commander. Oh, sorry, Darius is Commander Adams' master at arms aboard the Starship Eternia. He is quite literally the spirit of the Starship Eternia. It is our intention to treat him as a metaphysical being with a lightning quick mind and even faster re and even faster reflexes. Darius is the only one, save for Orko, aboard the Eternia, who knows Commander Adam's identity as He-Man. So Darius knows Prince Adam as He-Man. Um, okay. Pretty much like the uh, New Adventures cartoon, Hydron. Hydron has, it says, um, his gills give him the ability to breathe underwater. So obviously he was a, like Aquaman, I guess. <laughs> uh, Flog, Skeletor's principal enforcer. Flog is usually dispatched by the bony one to nudge rebellious Triaxians back into line. Uh, blah, 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 slush heads the same. Uh, yeah. As Filmation have done with many series before, when they attempted, um, they attempted to fashion a wealth of their own weird and wonderful characters. Um, this is what I wrote in the article. Though, without offending anyone that worked, on the, um, worked at Filmation on this particular, particular project, Many of the personality traits of these characters are very typical of what one would expect in a typical Saturday morning cartoon and don't seem anywhere near as dynamic as the personalities we were treated to in the He-Man and She-Ra cartoon. Okay, he oh my goodness. Right, okay, so we've got some random, the reason there's no, there's no real illustrations here, I can show you a few in a minute, but um, Ethan Devaro? Ethan Devaro? <laughs> Fucking the uh, way, who'd you say? I, 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 I says Evan. I think that, that's the guy's name because at first I was like, <laughs> Oh, I thought he was being polite. No, I thought he was trying to say, like, hey, fucking DeBarro, no, no, but no, he was like, Evan. Because okay. <laughs> I actually was expecting James to say, What the fuck? You know, as he was reading know. more and more of the stuff of singing oh, swords shit. and rams and all. It's a joke because it's definitely, it's so the name is, um, well, the first name is E P H O N. So it's Evan or F, F yeah, Evan. <laughs> Yes, it's a... F this. So Ethan, the most swashbuckling, <laughs> the most swashbuckling privateer in the Triax star system. She 
is a cross between Maureen O'Hara and bodybuilder Rachel McLeish. Feminine, but at the same time assertive, she can hold her own with any of the cutthroats she commands. Um, she, could, she, she leads a private, a privateer band which consists of Bernhardt, a compact, quick-witted robot, um, second in command. He's the, unemo he's the unemotional brains of the outfit and a lethal fighter. When he has a mind to be, his mechanical voice is always soft and oh so polite. Even when he's angry, maybe Was robot. Was three PO? Don't know. Maybe robot is female and has a crush on Orco. Mm. So they were thinking maybe you make her a ro female robot and she crushes on Orco. Mutant. That's a great name. Mutant. A two-headed reptilian being that always has two points of view. Oh, filmation. And it's always arguing with itself over what course of action. To oh, my God. Too bad 2.0. Oh, yeah. oh, man. They really they didn't care about these names. Here we go. This name. I don't know how they did this. Goliath. Big, oh, that's original. Lovable. This oh, huge, that's cold-blooded. Jesus. What a, what a description, too. Furry horned beast supplies brawn to the pirate band. Oh, God. I can't bother to read the rest of that. A bright red snake from one of the star system's middle planets. He's a great asset to the band because he can wriggle in places where nobody else can go. He is forever hungry and has a weakness for fresh, ripe food, fruit, which he swallows whole. Oh, God. Uh, Queen Ophelia. Imagine Queen Elizabeth I. I don't, I, the rest of this is boring. Like, as in that, it's just, who cares? Um, <laughs> we bring um, Jake's out to talk about Masters of Space. And it's like, what the hell's going on? It's like, okay, sorry. we're done with that segment. But no, go ahead. Uh, Queen Ophelia, earnest about governing. She wants only the best of her people. All 300 different races of them. Next one, La Takar. Um... Oh, so this guy, I remember when I read this, wily, larcenous, and filled with a glib surface charm. He's basically, they, they describe him as Sydney Green Street, was, which was actually the model for Kofos in the original yes. He-Man series. So imagine like a big fat dude who's like, rrr, rrr. Um, he has two thick tentacles where his arm should be. Of course he does. And he's the savviest businessman in the star system. And this is interesting. I do remember this. He's built the Club Royale up to one of the biggest, busiest casinos in the star system. And if I remember rightly, like in a lot of the development uh, notes, they kept going on about like this casino, like this big gambling thing. Was gonna be Sounds like Silverhawks almost. Yes, yeah, kind of thing. It was, it was like, we're going to go to this community hub of this casino thing. And I can, gambling is bad, kids, you know, or something. I don't, I don't know. Um, Torben, tribal leader of the. Uh, for, Primatox. He has a huge appetite. Why does everybody have a huge appetite? He's a chief, and when he wants something, he wants it now. There's a touch of Jim Henson's animal in him. I'm sure oh, there is. Um, Neil Rum, the pudgy, bad tempered hermit of New Canaan, lives in a desert cave far from the polluted steel cities that. Have fouled his planet. Oh, um, <laughs> shortly after this, oh, he man learns blah blah blah. He man finds out. You can tell I'm just like this. Steel oh, Claw, a dinosaur from Primatora. Steel Claw was hunted down by Nukanan poachers and left for dead. Royal zookeepers found the creature and transport. This is so much backstory for these characters that. No wonder they went out of business. Rescued by He Man, he vows vengeance on Skeletor and his minions. Rockella. Oh, Rockella. Wow. Rockella, a rock woman from the moon of Tremok. Rockella is a is a an is a sex pot. She's what? built more Yeah. She's built more along, along the lines of Tugboat Annie than Raquel Welsh and can be heard coming from a mile away, but her step is not light. She has a high school girl crush on He Man, but any kind of romantic future between a flesh and blood man 
and a woman made of granite blocks seems unlikely. Oh, Jesus. He Man is fond of Rockella in a brotherly way, and Rockella will do anything to help her suit her. When, danger is, well, when danger is afoot, she plunges into battle enthusiastically. Turbo. And after all that, James is like, here, go to my website and buy issue 14 of Serial Geek. Or what, what issue was that? Oh, God, I forgot. All right, so we're on Furbo. The next one after Furbo is great. Furbo, a fat, furry beast with four fat, furry arms. The top of Furbo's head opens up like a hinged lid to reveal a smaller, furry version of the same beast living inside. This guy's just like David Lynch. Ooh, horrible. The larger version of Furbo is kindly but dim. The smaller version is a fast-talking wise guy who loves to make fun of his bigger counterpart. <sighs> veggie man, a plant. <laughs> Is he a fucking carrot? <laughs> it's like Veggie Tales. <laughs> Here we go. I can we do uh, this one? A plant creature that can change itself into any kind of vegetation. What the hell for? <laughs> old Veg. Oh, they call him Old Veg for sure. Has a goofy, fun-loving personality and a warped sense of humor. He, she, it likes nothing better than to disguise himself as some innocuous growing thing um, and then burst into a loud, raucous laughter. Ha, ha, ha. Scaring the daylights out of any passerby. Fortunately, Veg is dedicated to restoring the queen to her throne. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, now for the villain. That was the hero. That wonderful lineup of heroes. Here we go. And now for the, oh, the first one. Oh my god. How did Skeletrix? Skeletrix's <laughs> okay. younger sister. What? And, and non stop <laughs> and non stop irritant. Like any brother and sister, they are constantly competitive. Oh my Skeletrix, god. Skeletrix went to all the best schools of the evil arts and is convinced that she can be far more a far more effective baddie than Skeletor. Oh my constantly, god. Constantly correcting him and pointing out his flaws, she makes him so nervous that he becomes a babbling bundle of bones whenever she's around. Worse. Oh god. Worse. Oh my god, worse. She thinks he man is a is a hunk. The most magnificent mass of muscle in the galaxy. As a character called Bark, a weird looking alien dog who is even nastier than Skeletor. Bark is the one living thing in... Oh, my God. Bark's bio is about four paragraphs long. And it's just about a dog that Skeletor likes more than anything. Oh. Oh, wow. We're not, uh, I might skip a few because they're boring. Slicer. Picture a broad-shouldered brute. No. Gargantua. With the body... Oh, here we go. You like this, Tyler. Gargantua. With the body of a powerful ape. King Kong meets Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the head of a woolly mammoth. Oh, let's not bother. Tech, Tech Rena, a gorgeous oh, humanoid know. robot whose warped memory chips have made her one of the most nasty machines. In the Doomsayer, he's a squat robot creature with an unruly mop of hair. Igor. Oh, so anyway, um, here's the development sketches for Skeletrix. Finish a water, we'll spit it out. <sighs> All right, say something to James because we need to pop up on the screen there. That's it. Oh, God. Shit. Oh. Say some more, James, to pop that on the screen. But it doesn't pop up. Yeah. Um, can you see that? Is that all right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's um, Skeletrix. That's Skeletrix. And now is Skeletrix. Obviously, development sketches. Um, yeah. <sighs> You know what I don't get about all of that? I mean, I can understand all the new characters that they would have tried to create, but all of a sudden now he has a sister? I mean, how would they even explain? You're miss we haven't got to his niece and nephew. Oh, oh no. fuck. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> the whole Man, family's I, here. I tell you, like, new adventures of He-Man Carter <laughs> 2, those scientists are looking a little bit more badass now. <laughs> oh. Hey, you haven't heard their names. This might change your opinion. You might think, well... His niece and nephew 
could have been the next big thing. Is this where so Skeleton niece, comes in? His niece and nephew are Funny Bone and Honey Bone. <laughs> I'm not going to read this. Because they will make you hate everything. Um, they like to play... Wait, let me read the abrupt. They like to play practical jokes on their uncle, um, especially in moments of real crisis. Um, fu everything Funny Bone does really frosts Skeletor's shorts. Oh, but then, oh, God. But every once in a while, Skeletor has a moment of compassion for his little, his little uh, character who resembles him so much. At those times, we momentarily see a warmer side of Skeletor. It sounds like mate, it makes a Christmas special, like, blooming... Evil, you know. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> he's, we, he's lost. He's like, that's it. Is, is there more characters? Is, uh, like I say, the, the character details. I did go into a lot of detail, as in when I when I wrote when I did my research. This I wrote everything I could. It's just reading it back. There's so much just fluff, as in not that I've put in. That's from the actual thing. Um. Uh, Strange New Worlds is the heading for this one. So this is just the planet. Um, Primatoria. Uh, it sounds like some kind of strange pasta. But it's actually a large planet close to the three suns. Tropical, filled with dinosaurs. Uh, at Argon, a planet that is inhabited by a race of yum yucks. Oh. The moons of Argon. Yeah, they exist. New Canaan, the Royal Triaxian Palace, NORAD. Okay, NORAD, a skull-shaped planet, which obviously became Nordor. Nordor, Nordor. Yeah. A skull-shaped planet, a much farther from the free stars, life-giving light and warmth. It is icy, forbidding, a perfect place for Skeletor to set up his headquarters. The planet is inhabited by cadaverous-looking ice creatures with powerful pincer claws. Skeletor is delighted to make them his slaves when he invades. Um, yep. So yeah, here's what I wrote about the talking sword. The way, oh yeah, so this is the, the, amongst other things. The way in which He-Man acquires the new sword of power is something that is described in numerous ways. So that, that obviously, they went through a, a few versions. In one scenario, Adam locates the sword in a cave on the planet Primatoria. Another situation has the sorceress present Adam with the work with the sword prior to his journey into the future. A third option has the sword located on the starship Eternia itself, with Adam having to battle Darius in order to prove that he is worthy of obtaining the sword. In this final scenario, once he has proved himself, once he has proved his worth by saving the life of Darius, he holds up the ultimate sword of power and commands, let the power be mine, and transforms into He-Man. Okay. By far the most unique and somewhat disturbing of the scenario has Adam and Darius locate the sword on the planet Titania. They discover the sword of power in a large crystal rock. Darius, who is very much like Man at Arms in this particular script, struggles and strains to pull the sword out of the crystal. Adam grabs the sword handle and says, by the powers of past and future joined, I have the power. Adam is transformed into He-Man, much to Darius's surprise. However, the pair are both stunned when they hear another voice within the cave. The voice turns out to be that of the Sword of Power. Below is an example. Oh, I actually wrote the dialogue. This, this is <clears throat> my, my, my He-Man voice. So you talk, do you, the sword? Of course I talk. Why wouldn't I? And it's about time somebody got me out of that rock. But I wasn't expecting He-Man to do it. Darius, you've heard of him? The sword, everyone's heard of He-Man, but I thought he'd be bigger. He-Man, sorry to disappoint you. Don't worry, I'll get over it. And you know I'm doing the voice they would have used. Yeah, and yeah. you sound just like the comic keeper. So that, that's, that, I get, prop, props to doing such a, a perfect impression, but God, yeah, it just, oh, not only, Here we go. Not only was, this is what I wrote afterwards, not only was that the kind of dialogue the sword would spout, but it would, like, does he is his dialogue written like Zagras, or or is it? I mean, does it? Oh, oh, Joe, you're, Joe is gonna wet himself, really. I think Joe's <sighs> gonna sink deeper into his seat. Not only just... would that the kind of dialogue the sword would spout, but the sword would also have a nose, two eyes, and a mouth. 
fuck. Oh, God damn it. Oh, God. Anyway, so, somebody's got to draw it up now. Now you got to animate this. Somebody's got to make, make a picture of this. I have got to see this horrible. We're trying to fake it. We're going to do the Masters of Space. Oh, Jesus. That is an Easter egg. Like, what the hell's that in the background? You have like a rack of all these weapons. <laughs> it's this shitty sword. Yeah, yeah you know, there should be like a sing, uh, yeah, singing sword somewhere thrown in. Just, just. In the back, for no reason. The battle faker pulls out a sword. It's the singing sword. Yeah, it's like Roger oh. Rabbit. <laughs> um, my God. So, uh, we mentioned we're planning to do um, a five part origin story because obviously they've done it with um, She Ra and Filmation's Ghostbusters. So, we're going to do that with this. Uh, so, episode one was going to be called The Last Battle. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Okay, I'll, I might as well read it. The episode begins with He Man and Skeletor locked in a furious battle to the finish. Skeletor looks as though he has the upper hand until a clever maneuver by He Man blasts Skeletor through a space portal and into another dimension. Um, with the victory over evil at last achieved, peace comes to Eternia. However, the, so the, the beauty of this is, I love the idea that uh, as awful as what we've heard, just heard is, as in the singing, the talking sword, can you imagine like these scenes would have all been filmation though? So like the idea of, with victory over at last achieved, um, the, so the sorceress appears before Adam and tells him that he and the universe uh, faces the most serious threat that they have ever seen. The sorceress then conjures a visual, a visual image of Skeletor on the other side of the portal in a future galaxy far away, now based on the planet Noran, gathering new villains. Uh, the sorceress asks Adam that if he is there, there is no way... Oh, the sorceress asks Adam, if there, is a, if there are a way he could follow Skeletor, would he, even if it means never being able to return to Eternia? Adam ponders, um, and then obviously says, let's do this. Uh, so then the sorceress, oh, this is the interesting part. The sorceress says she will now reveal the most powerful secret of Castle Grayskull. Uh, it's not the sword. The I sorceress instructs Adam to withdraw the sword of power. As he does so, the ground begins to rumble and massive streaks of lightning dart across the sky. The sorceress commands Adam to hurl the sword of power into the wall of Castle Grayskull. The ground around Castle Grayskull bubbles, rolls, and finally erupts and the smoke, flashing lights, and ashes gradually clear as the starship Eternia rises from the ruins of Castle Grayskull. That was actually something mm. that they, yeah. um, they illustrated there. Can you see that? I've seen that before, too. Yeah, yeah. that one's been a public image. So that was, they did like, um, I don't know if anybody else hasn't seen it, it's uh, Castle Grayskull split in two. With, um, Might Castle be the only cool thing from this whole pitch so far is just that mm -hmm. uh, image right yeah. there. Yeah. He, um, there was like, about, I think about four images. Uh, so yeah, um, he, he, the sword splits. Uh, oh wow, here's something I forgot. That wasn't the fire. Okay. Um, so yeah, Slash of Eternia rises. The sorceress's father, Darius, materializes outside of the ship in a blaze of light and turns the ship over to Adam. An excited orca asks if he can accompany Adam. Um, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> the sorceress bids Adam farewell, and he heads to the future. Um, yeah, episode two, as the starship Eternia races through a long, bright tunnel, Adam loses control and um, is unable to locate Darius. There's a lot of, like, padding to this story. Uh, well, tell you what, honestly... Like you said, you don't have to give every bit, but to be yeah. honest, now is that still available for purchase? Because you can tell fans where to go if they'd like to per you know purchase that issue because there's still probably a lot of good content that I'm sure they'd like oh, to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, there's still a lot of bad content, but yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mean that. I just meant, you know, yeah, we were having fun with like just shitting around with the one thing, but I know mean, that's just it's, it's an amazing thing to have. So just tell everybody where they can get it. And of course, we'll pop a link eventually. Yeah, if you get issue 14 of Serial Geek, so you can get it on. Um... Uh, what's my when I'm, I haven't used it in a while. My He Man and She Ra shop is still uh, still a thing. So if you go to www.hemanshirashop for one word, dot com, you can get this issue and issue 13 as well, which are kind of the He Man and She Ra issues. But like uh, in here, I've also got um, this was like my golden book uh, homage to uh, it was a two-part She-Ra story. I'm not going to show part. I'm not going to show. There's too many spoilers in here if I do show. But the secret's out. Parts one and two. And this was like, I did it as like a golden. Oh, book. that's beautiful. Yeah. I like that. Oh, that's I awesome. Too much because I can spoil. This is like a Dora. 
looking out. Um, because part one ends with like, again, this would be something I'd love to turn into an episode because it's, it's a fan story <clears throat> that I wrote in the 90s. Uh, when we, you know, when we were on the news groups and stuff on the maiden list, and people loved it, and I kept it around for years, and then eventually turned it into this. Oh, you can't really see it here. That's Adora talking to. Uh, no, it looks great. And my question is now: How many issues could they buy? Different issues could they buy off of your website? Um, I think on the He-Man Shira shop, there's um, oh god, seven issues, seven, eight, nine, ten. I was saying seven, eight, nine, ten. 12, 13, 14. So, like eight issues. Um, if you go okay, to. Cause the, I, yeah, go on. I mean, because basically what I want to say is, you know, for the, a lot of the fans who didn't know you did Serial Geek, who might be new to this, or who have, you know, didn't know about you and didn't know about Serial Geek, or maybe who have known about you but never knew about it, it's their way of finally, you know, getting copies of that, along with, is Serial Geek something that you'd like to continue or start again? Because I didn't know if you're still doing it or, um, or progress on that. I'm trying to get the last two issues out this year. That's that's my goal because people pre-ordered those issues. We're talking four or five years ago, and there've been some very patient people. The problem is in between when people started pre-ordering issues 15 and 16, I took Serial Geek to Comic Con, and it, uh, that, that story is, if not relatively well known, um, not one worth repeating. Where I basically, I, I remember, I remember you making a statement about that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, and it yeah. was it was basically like Serial Geek bombed out in San Diego Comic Con because. Nobody at San Diego Comic Con buys comics or magazines. They go to dress up, and, which is fine. I don't mind. No, it's bullshit. Yeah, I, I think it is. They, yeah, the, yeah, the, I, the Comic Con I, I first went to, I first went to San Diego in 2005, 2006, when we were doing the He Man DVDs, and it was such a different convention. There were people still dressing up, but people were still buying stuff. And then when I went in 2014 with um, Serial Geek, nobody was buying stuff um, to the point where Mile, Mile High Comics have been, been doing the Comic Con since the. 70s or when it first started and i think that was their last ever one they said this is nobody's coming to buy our stuff anymore nobody's here to buy they're they're here to have a good time and connect with people that's fine but if you go there as a as a business you're you're you know plumb out of luck but yeah serial geek the short and sweet of it is um yeah two more issues to come and it's just a magazine about 80s cartoons so i cover it's 100 pages glossy pages Cover stuff like that's well, a hell of a lot to get. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, like Dungeon Dragons, um, Inspector Gadget. Uh, I talk about the I love Inspector, some Dungeon Gadget. Dragons, yeah. Inspector Gadget pilot. Just to let, oh, sorry, I was gonna let you know, Nathan, d Nathan did pop up uh, the link to uh, the page right here in the comments. And after, of course, we're done with the video, we'll put the link in when we do the you know refresh of the whole video and put the link oh, no, there for anybody else. Just... He's done some cool art because I bought two copies, I bought one that, that features um. James's take on the uh, Marvel animation, which covers Spider Man and his amazing friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Pride of the X Men and all that. And then uh, I, I remember I bought one in particular. Um, it's, it's, it's the one that I can't remember what, what number it is, but it's the one with uh, She Ra have with the, with the punch face on the cover. Oh, that's the first. I thing. got that one. First, yeah, that's what I thought, where you you'd, uh, talk about the Star Marvel comics. Oh, no, no, that one, that the, or, the Star or, Marvel comics was. Was that, issue... was that the Amazing Friends issue? Yeah, I think that's the same one because that was my comics issue. Yeah. I think that was. Maybe issue five or six. Yeah, yeah it, was one of, it was an earlier issue, but he oh, that, yeah. that was where I first saw like the like well at that time the one shot from the unproduced Star Marvel comic that had He Man slicing through a Batman. Oh yeah, the psh, one yeah, piece. Great, great I image. bought it specifically for that. Like I thought, oh my god, I have to have this image. And I read I read those articles like back and forth all of I mean both issues and had different intentions of buying more too. But it was just you know, and that's my fault for not making a party because they are some really interesting art and uh, articles and kick-ass artwork like it's fun he did oh, one yeah, too yeah. i forgot what issue where you got egon and man at arms oh yeah, yeah, yeah something which i thought was really cool so it's just really cool to see all these cool characters that you splice together from an assortment like uh there's a uh, an article with larry detaglio too and, and i forgot yeah what he did was. he did um, an interview on the first issue i think that was yeah he did an interview and um i mean i even had like rob lamb who's written for he-man write an article or like a little thing about a team up because you do unlikely team ups and we did a team up between Thunderstick from Brave Star and Trapjaw, the obviously the robot. Oh, that's awesome. Artist. Yeah. And Rob Lamb wrote that little uh, little couple you know a few paragraphs of text for it. And I was like, that's awesome. Um but yeah people I remember when I went out to LA um one year and I can't remember if it was I think it was Larry Dottilio and he was saying you know obviously a lot of the writers on He Man worked on a lot of those 80s shows would all meet up and have little gaming sessions and stuff. They're all geeks, all those guys. 
and he said that people like all the guys knew about serial geek and i was like oh it's so weird it's like the idea that my magazine was being read by the people that worked in the industry all those years ago so i was like that's pretty cool but um yeah so serial geek still got to get it going but yeah it's uh at the moment not i wouldn't say in hiatus but just uh yeah it'll be back at some point but not for too long i don't think but like i think when the return of fake is done that'll be my next let's get this out of the way because people have been waiting for this and i want to do the last two issues because in that in one of the last two issues i want to do the um the article about the he-man video game that filmation had planned which was um the most complicated video game ever where <laughs> it's like a video game not as in a computer game or like this as in you pop a tape in and you play a board game and it would be a filmation cartoon and it would all be um, it would have a timer on and you'd have to go back and forward like roll the dice go to this part of the tape and this script is huge it's like 90 something pages and it uses scenes from previous episodes with lots of new dialogue think like i think they were going to do skeletor's revenge where you take a, existing footage and then put in a bunch of new stuff as well he-man talking to the audience um, but the game itself, the board game, was crazy. They even act, they they did actually advertise the board game in um, one of the Mattel catalogs. So it did come close to some sort of production. Oh wow! Yeah, they they never went anywhere. They they were going to do this um, board stroke video game, and you can see there's I, I, I can send you a link, a, a, an image at some point um, yeah. of, of this. Yeah, like this this uh, it's like hey kids, and they were going to do a Shira one as well. But I never I never saw the script for that. But my friend Lee in America owns the E-Man script. He's like, do you want a copy? I was like, yeah, sure, man. And it's it's huge. And the game is so... We sat there. I think, no, Lee did. He sat there and tried to understand it. And even, I think, Doosan, um, I sent him it. And he was like, I'm going to try and figure it. And he was just like, yep. confusing. I was just going to say, not to interrupt, but that it sounds pretty cool because there was uh, two games. I, I honestly couldn't you know, remember the names of them. But I remember as a kid, uh, the whole family would play one where you would put it in a tape. And then they would tell you to pause and then it would like ask a question. Then we had to uh, see if we remembered yeah. what something said or you, it would like go black. Another one was something where it did say, OK, hit pause. Try to remember this. Roll this. Now, fast forward to the twenty two point three one. Yeah, mark, yeah, yeah. And then you. Yeah. OK, that sounds like it would have been interesting because, yeah, I remember those games. I think, yeah, I mean, like based on that. But um, what, when you read the instructions for it, it's, it's, it's almost like. Place card X next to the man at arms, mate. Oh, you know, it's, it's like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> it's like, and it's right. kids. So just kids will be crying, going, I want to watch the cartoon. They're like, you can't watch the cartoon, you've got to play the game. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, was, uh, it looked like something fun or interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a unique little piece of history, just this, this random script. The other thing I've got somewhere, I don't know where it is, it's, um, I've, I, got, I found when I was in one of the warehouses, I think this was when it was in San Diego, I found a two-page storyboard the filmation done for the attack track but it was the filmation attack track and it was going to be for like an advert and i was like oh were they planning to make a toy why did they and it says um, mattel advert attack track and it's the filmation attack track going over the things and going around corners and stuff and i was like what was that for so yeah huh. that does that sounds Very different cool. oh. all, right. all right well now i'm gonna pass it james to tyler because tyler's gonna put us into the Final segment of the show before obviously we let fans ask any questions, but Tyler, I'm passing it to you, bud. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a commentary for Tealer's Quest from season one. Um, I'm going to be using the official He Man YouTube channel. That's the link that I'm using. I'm assuming Nathan probably put that up. Um, yeah, so tell but, me when to, to play it. I'll just get it up now. Okay. It's quite funny. The only time I ever go back to the um, official He Man channel is just to source episodes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got an advert playing, of course. Oh, this will the adverts click uh, kick in though? I say, I, I, many, I'm, well, wait. Oh, well, if there's another one we can use, because I, I, um, I'm because I have YouTube Red, so I, I don't have to worry about the uh, oh, advertisement. Right. The advertisement too. Let me see if there's another one here. Because um, I mean, I can always, I can always like, uh, you know, just skip around, play around, it'd be fine. I d yeah, actually, I'll just use the official one. Well, yeah. I was gonna say, what well, uh, for you. I was going to say, what about your commentary? Was there, is there commercials there in is that, that one? Is that put adverts on that from the looks of it? Um, yeah, it's, it's fine. I'll just... Uh, well, could I play... Wait a sec, let me think. My brain is trying to work here. Because when I worked for the official YouTube channel, they gave me all the episodes on a like a hard disk. Yeah. I might... Could I just play that? That would probably make more sense. Yeah. Let me just do that. Okay. okay. 
my powerful hard drive. Where is it? I can't find it now. Joe, is yours going to have uh, commercials in it too? No, no, I made uh well, remember when I did the free YouTube red for Cobra Kai, I got that for another month. So I'm uh, commercial free for at least, I don't know, X amount Honestly, of days. Honestly, I think so. you probably canceled the hell out of that. Like, I ain't oh, no. You know what's funny? It's, hey, once you cancel it, though, they still have it um, going to like another couple weeks. So I still got another couple weeks on it. Okay. So I'm good. <laughs> yeah, this is like, hey. And I, I do get kind of addicted to it. Like you said, when you get YouTube red, you don't have to worry about any advertisements. And, and that is kind of a great thing to not see. Well, especially now that YouTube have started putting two adverts back to back. So when you start YouTube, oh, yeah, yeah you God get damn it. Be like a seven second video followed by a six second advert and you can't skip them. It's just like, oh, right, right. Yeah, um, I can't. Okay, so of course, let me get this going. Um, he man, episode six. I hope my connection stays because a big storm has started kicking up. I heard it a little bit ago. I wanted to make sure. So I hope I don't get kicked off. Okay, right. I've got, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got, uh, yeah, I've got it lined up. So, yeah, I'm ready when you gents are. All right. I'll just count down. Three, two, one, action. Uh, uh, I want to ask oh, you too, James, like, you know, do you revisit a lot of these episodes in your spare time or, or have just, you know, they pretty much embedded in your brain, aside from working on the, the Faker project? I was going to say that the return of Faker pretty much has all my time taken up. The only time, actually, no, that's a, that's a good question. The only time I'm revisiting them at the moment is when I think, like I say, up until maybe a week, two weeks ago, I was still tweaking dialogue. And so I would, um, I would go back through the episodes and go, maybe I could use that instead. So I have been going back to and from, and then maybe the odd sequence where I said to do saying, oh, maybe let's change this instead of that, or maybe have that shot of He-Man posed that way instead of that. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I do go back, but I haven't sat down properly and gone, right, let me watch an episode of He-Man. That hasn't happened in a long time. But me sitting here watching Teela's Quest is, uh, yeah, that's quite a, quite a rarity, as it, as it were. And, um, and yeah. an episode that I always tell people, everybody knows this one. <laughs> Casual fans, uh, I always tell the story when I worked at the civil service. I remember being in the pub after work one night, and people found out that I was. Um, this was it just. But this was when people found out I just wrote um, He-Man website stuff before I'd even worked on the brand. And pe and there was a group of people, and at least two of the people said, "Oh, was wasn't that an episode where the the Teela finds her mum and stuff?" And so people knew that. And the other episode people all knew was Orco had a female Orco. You know, so it's Dawn of Dragoon and Teela's quest kind of. I always said Tudor's Quest is the one episode or probably the episode of the series that transcends the show mm. where everybody knows this origin story. It's, it's such a beautiful story. Like the oh, yeah, story. it is. But, by the way, a quick side note, that's the character that we should have gotten figure for him. That would have looked much better to have that um, Captain Marlena Glenn as an action figure instead of the one with the green. I, I wasn't a big fan of it. I understand the aesthetics of like how you yeah, from the course, outfit yeah. to that, but I'd have preferred I always wanted, yeah, the, the, white, the white astronaut outfit. It's, um, yeah. it's pretty badass. But yeah, it's uh, um, what, what I always loved about this opening scene was just it's it's I, I always use the term Saturday morning cartoon, even though obviously it was a syndicated show. But it's uh, the opening of Tita's Quest. This like this scene is just I mean, one, it's all Paul Dini dialogue, but you just have Adam and t um, Adam and Queen Marlena, his mum, just talking, and it's such a beautifully even with the music, it's just so perfect. If you want to show someone the series that's going to be so cynical of it. It's like, watch this. This is a mother and uh, son talking, and it's all natural, and it's just so perfect. And then when Teela pops in, it's like, oh, by the way, the woman voicing the queen also voices Teela. People are like, wait, what? And she, it's just Linda Gary's ability to voice, and she voices the sorceress in this episode, the ability to have three distinct voices. There's no similar tones, of course, because no voice act actor, actress can truly disguise the voice 100%. But the way she plays Marlena is so different to the way she plays Teela and the Sorceress. And I always love this scene, just so, so beautiful. I, I dare say that that sequence we just watched is arguably the most touching scene of the series yeah. next to um, He-Man's first encounter with Grandmere. Like, I, I associate those two. And, and this episode, especially at the end with the Sorceress giving her moment with Teela before she wipes her memory. Like, I, I like, even as a kid, I found that to be very touching like it didn't bring me to tears as an adult i find it even more emotionally touching but yeah, as a kid it was 
and the music too. Like that was what was so good about this is music we've heard in various episodes used at the right time has so much more of an, a, a higher impact. I think. I always, I always thought. I mean, even as a kid watching this, I always thought it would have been really good. I've said this before in a few commentaries where if if um, Taylor put on the memory thing, and then you see Prince Adam as He Man doing stuff, and she'd be like, "Why are you saying?" Because obviously it's a memory thing. Where were you this morning? It's like you know, fighting evil. It should have been like really confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, the opening scenes of Taylor's Quest, like we've gone from mother, uh, mother, son to son and best friend in Taylor. So now we've got man at arms and all so you get that dynamic and then we get man at arms father daughter dynamic so it's like literally every and it's just all dialogue i mean don't worry you've got these you know comedic scenes and how they play but it is just character building you, it's you, like watching a day at the at the palace like this yes, is exactly, what yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they call yeah. this episode aka a day at the palace because it really is just people going about their own lives you know yes there are some MacGuffins like testing the memory projector or can make it a magic box music box um, but yeah, it just it works so perfectly, and it's it's the, the way they used to play. You know, in these initial episodes, I love the fact that Man at Arms was so gruff. You know, this this Man at Arms doesn't take shit. Those, <clears throat> those numbers, by chance, did they represent anything? Because I know you use no, your no, fountain of knowledge. Just random, random. Oh, okay. Things. But I always love the I always love the idea that all kind of acts of magic. I'm going to play make a music box and makes a bomb. Just genius. Yeah. <laughs> This gag was always, I always thought it was so good. It's, it, you got it's basic storytelling, but it's, it's done with such heart. That was the beauty of, um, especially a lot of the early season episodes, is the writers clearly enjoyed what they were doing. And it's like, let's, let's go for it. I love or- Orko's mentality. Like his whole attitude is like, oh, well, and yeah, you know, just so <laughs> laid back about what he's doing. Like, I, it's, it's, and he's not in it for very long, but God, is he w- written so well. Yeah, in this. and I also like that that shot of man. I was breaking the fourth wall where like the, the music box goes past him and he turns to the camera and it's like wow, you don't. <laughs> this the fourth wall break happens always in the moral segment, but it rarely, you know, he man's and when I want to buy use bolo and a few other scenes. Um, I actually purposely, <laughs> and again, it's that a bit of it did a fourth wall. There's a fourth wall break in the Return of Faker, and you, you'll know it when you see it. But it's just so, and it's not. From a previous existing one, again, it's using the dialogue in a different way, and it's like, oh, okay. So that's there's, cool. And always, yeah, that part right here, I always liked. I mean, when you, you know, she's wanting to know about her family, and you hear about yeah. her father, you know, like dying, but you know, the secret of a mother, and maybe one day, it's just, it, it's, it's touching. It's, it's just sad, you know, to know that she, she wants to know about her real parents, and she's seen the relationship with Adam, obviously, and his mother, and. It's Alan does a good that, job of delivering Men at Arms' dialogue right there. Like he, you know, it's it's short, but I mean, er, everything, er, like everyone really saw like the potential in the script because there there's such care in addressing how this character would really respond to the situation. It's not just a flat line reading the dialogue. It just, I, I really feel like, I mean, everything, er, everybody. I mean, and, and Linda Gay steals the show too. I was gonna say Teela's voice in um in that bit where she's doing like the self narration, which is yeah, that's I mean like that's kind of script writing in a certain way, but it's just so softly spoken and it feels very natural. Yeah, exactly. And and Orko's line there when he, he turns up and he's like, "Did Cringy use your shield as a water dish?" Which is a, a, another great line because you just immediately picture that scene. You, you don't have to have seen it to know that she would have been like, "What the hell?" Are you? you know, to have that yeah. <laughs> again, it builds up the world. Without having to show it, and it's, it's brilliant. What's what's good about this too is I, you know, because and James, I know you like Orko, and so does Joe. And I, I, what I, I really love that he's portrayed like the way he should have been in every episode. Yeah, you know, a, a very caring and, you know, n- not a, a nimwit or a, 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 a child all the time. Like he's an equal to them. He's just, you know, he's rambunctious to a certain extent, and we all know somebody who's like that. And I. I like that he's he's played it like an equal essentially. Yeah, that was the the best Orko was always the the one that wasn't a child. Well, he was he was a child, but he wasn't. Yeah, like Dawn of Dragoon is the ultimate Orko, if you ask me. Oh, it, it is, it is without a doubt. He written, and like it's funny you see Orko without the ears. That was something they a lot of the storyboard artists did in the. If you go back to the the first shot of Orko there, and um, yeah, a lot of the early ones he just. For some reason, the storyboard artist never gave him ears. 
It was a really bizarre thing. It's quite funny as well, coming up is like the shot of you know, Adam with a sword over his head. A lot of the shots from this episode end up as um, ended up as promotional images for the series, like Teela doing that walk throughout the palace. Um, this one of Prince Adam holding the sword was used as one of the publicity shots, um, was, you know, raised above his head. I actually own that background, the big pan of the cavern. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah? I mean, it's utterly pointless to own it, but I remember just thinking, oh, I know what that's from. I'm going to get that because it's from the publicity thing. <laughs> So yeah, I um yeah I remember as, I remember watching this as a kid on a Sunday morning because they He Man was ever only shown <clears throat> twice in the UK as in once and then reruns over the space of God about seven or eight years. So if you saw if you missed an episode, you wouldn't get to see it for another like three or four years. Oh wow! So I'm I think I'm I vaguely I think I must have seen Taylor's Quest the first time around, but don't recall it. So the next time I saw it for the Technically, the first time was like 1987 when they started rerunning the series. And um, I remember watching this like early on a Sunday morning, just thinking this is the greatest thing ever. Because also, this was the episode from the Sticker Album. And I was like, yeah, this is the Sticker <laughs> Album episode. Um, again, serious skeleton, serious Merman as well. Very. Like Merman, because he doesn't make that many appearances in the series. Like the search for the VHO, he's pretty serious in that. But as soon as those writers, and I, I I forgive him for it, and I totally understand. As soon as those writers discovered the a certain way to write for the villains, they just went they went in that direction, which is fair enough. It's like, well, let's keep them serious, but play them for giggles every once in a while. Yeah. Boy, works. do I love this music, James. This is the music that I always love. So spooky and eerie. Just It just drew you in in the scene. Yeah. And yeah. the sound of the shadow be scuffing off. You yeah. Know, to come get her. Like, all these sounds and... The shriek, like I mean, that's that shrieking noise. I'm always associated with the Shadow Beast first, even though you'd hear it multiple times throughout the show. The other thing I remember reading about when they um, designed the Crystal Sea, the backgrounds here. Originally, they didn't want to have. You can see there's the line art, the typical formation thing, where they drew the black outline on the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. When they reused the back, when they came to do the backgrounds again for um, the Dragon's Gift, they decided. I think it was Robert Lamb said. Can we not do the black line art so we just have pure crystal backgrounds? So that's uh, they originally they were going to do that with this, but for most like, no, let's give them, let's do light uh, outlines. But then, yeah, for the Dragon's Gift, they they shifted it. Huh. This is one of my favorite transitions as well when Tila says, and now back to business. Yeah. yeah. The build up and then the big E Man transition. Again, did something very similar in the Return of Faker. Actually, did something exactly the same in Return of Faker because I was like, I want that transition. So I like how I like how James notices things like that because that's how I always look at the show, like just different touches like that, which you don't see that often in the show. Like I mean, yeah. a, a variety of transitions, like it's just stuff that because some of these episodes repeat the same thing, which is great because when they, you know, mix it up just a little bit, you never forget it. I'm just there's something. Oh my goodness, um, it's going to kill me. Uh, who's Oh, my God. So we're looking at the Oracle of the Crystal Sea, which is a, a, an amazing scene. Bruce Timm did a lot of the layout for this. You know, Bruce Timm of Batman the Animated oh, Series. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he did He did quite a lot of layout for this episode. So I've got sketches where he's designed the – I don't – not designed, but he did a lot of the layout there where she walks in a shot and the, the Oracle's there and a lot of the close-ups. The – oh, my goodness, it's going to kill me if I don't remember his name. Dusan, if you're in the chat, what's the <laughs> actual name that the Oracle is based on? It was, an, it was about a few years ago, and I was like, oh, my God, it's him. And Doosan was like, oh, you're totally right. Is he, is he supposed to be based off of that one uh, guy in Clash of the Titans? Or, Olivier. Um, no, no, no. Think of a horror actor, classic. Um, Vincent, uh, oh, Vincent, Price? Price. Vincent Price. Vincent Price. Really? Oh, we both, all Vincent three all three of us at the same time said Vincent Price. How bizarre is that? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's Vincent Price. Uh, and it was something I didn't clock for years, and I, I'm not even, I don't even know if I put it in the um, – the Dark Horse guy, but I remember watching it and I said to Dusan, have you noticed that the Oracle of Vincent Price is like, it's Vincent Price? I was like, I know. How did we know? <laughs> um, oh, also, randomly, I own um, uh, the background. I didn't uh, forget. I'm not, I'm not, this isn't me showing off. I own that background. I was, this long pan here where you see do, 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 all the way oh, down. Yeah. Um, afterwards, I'll, I'll get it out, as they say, because um, it's just to the left of me. I've just got to get out of a big folder. But uh, you can see how it looked. I got my friend. Oh, okay. Oh, that's awesome. It years ago, and she's five two, and it's about three quarters of her height. It's amazing. Wow. It's so good. <laughs> wow. 
Um, but yeah, again, I think Tyler knows. What I'm about. It's one of my favourite little moments. In this, this creeped me out as a kid. Like it's so well done. That was awesome. Each time the camera just you look at those three shots. Camera trucks in every time. It's just so again filmations. Like we could just do transit like that. That will just zoom in because it just makes it look so much dra- uh, so much more dramatic. So that's what bothers me though. Like knowing like I, I, I mean. I've often wondered, like, if these guys, like, saw these episodes completely, oh, this is great, like, we can tell real serious stories here, and I, I just, and I've always been bothered, I, 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 you know, you made your mentions about season two, just, it's such a shame that the, the tone could not be sustained throughout the show, like, season one, I think the vast majority, you know, is like this, but th- this really pushes the limits of a very, very serious tone. Um, Absolutely. Um, I just... I really wish it could have been maintained and not not felt like that we had to brighten it up for all the people who thought this was a show to teaching kids how to you know you know raise the devil. Yeah, raise the devil. If you had the right spells, of course. Oh, well, of course. But I, but I also like too that you know like in uh, you know uh, to save Skeletor and uh, the cosmic comic. You know when they're they're you know using incantations and things like that too, just touches like that. But uh, and this effect too of the crystal ball like glowing. In, in front oh, yeah, of the I mean, battle cap. Formations, formations special effects were something amazing. They they were, were so good at that. It's ridiculous. Me and Dusan always like to joke about lazy formation when, whenever we're working on something really hard. Just like, oh, yeah, lazy formation. <laughs> um, annoyingly, my video stopped. So, uh, as in uh, the, the video I'm watching, the episode, what what shot are we on now? What scene? Or uh, Merman <laughs> is talking to Tila in the yeah. silhouette of them. Let me know when he holds up the Crimson Pearl if he's done that already. And not yet. He's, he's going to be doing right that now. Okay. Crimson yeah. Pearl. Crimson Pearl. Okay, so I'm there now. I might be about. I might be about a second behind. So yes, Taylor's at least. Time. Yeah, now you're getting the Clash of the Titans vibe with this whole scene here. But you know what I also liked about that is when he mentioned it about being 20 years ago. Yeah. This is for people who always said, you know, Taylor's 16 in the cartoon. So is Adam. I was like, well, right there, you know, she's 20 years old. At least yeah. if that makes sense, because yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, because uh, this is like the one episode my dad would quote because he always remembered Merman saying Bakul. Like, that was just one thing my dad remembered because I watched the hell out of the greatest <laughs> adventures of all VHS tape. Oh, of course, yeah. And, uh, I, and I'd watched all three episodes. And never, it was never like watch one. I would sit and watch all three. And he always remembered Bakul and the way Merman would say it. And he would try to do his best Merman impression. I just, <laughs> for whatever reason, it just stuck out to him. I, and probably not in the, the you know, he didn't say it, well. He would just say it in a jokey manner, but it was his way of saying, "God, you watch that tape a lot." <laughs> I think it's such a shame that the uh, the fishmen never came back. They're always like, yeah, they were, and they're very unique looking too. Like it's it's and it's fun to think of of these evil warriors. Like they they work for Skeletor, but they have minions of their own. Like they well, it's like a lineup of power almost. Yeah, like the Ladybird books had the um, Beastman. Or... No, Beastman had like his own Beastmen. And um, Merman in those books had his own like uh, fishmen, but they weren't they looked nothing like these ones. Uh, yeah, but yeah. It's, it's done like golden books too. Like Beastman has like his own like demon arm and the count are all orange. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of my favorite mistakes coming up here. Not, not one they often made actually. Formation often get a bad rap for, oh, they his you know, the, the continuity was bad. It's like this is probably the worst one when he throws the sword and then he's, he actually says, Tila, use my sword. And it's on his back. He's my oh, sword. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure, that on the wall. And, but that was an awesome visual. I always loved seeing Taylor with the oh, sword. Yeah. yeah. I, own, I own this cell setup as well, the one of He Man, Taylor, and Battle Cat with Taylor holding the sword, which was used on so many things. Yeah. And randomly, I picked it at one of the warehouses. I was like, I think I'll take that. Uh, Merman fell adult, for I... the old thing again. That th- this is what cracks up is here. The poor thing just shattered. I was like, well, that's some cheap craftsmanship yeah. that earlier yeah. survived yeah. 20 years ago. I always oh. found, for some reason, as an adult, like them when when Merman says "obey your master" and destroy them, and the human thing kicks in, and Zoar grabs it. I just thought, God, that's exciting! Just oh, that yeah. whole package. Yeah. I feel sorry. I always think here, you know, he man l- nearly kills Merman. He's like, yeah. oh. <laughs> I was like, it's a way of saying, you know what? You put me through all this shit, so I'm I'm gonna save you, but you're gonna get a good beating on the head for it. <laughs> I just love the way Merman land like ducks and rolls. It's like that's how you survive one yeah. of those falls. Right, but um, yeah, again, this um, the, the climactic battle with uh, with Bakul. 
because I remember that was the other thing in the script. I remember the um, the Crystal Sea that all the water was supposed to be like black and foreboding, but then they just used simple water, which I don't have a problem with. Uh, and yeah, in typical formation fashion, which I, again I totally understand why they said it. Um, he says, you know, maybe this will hold back all for another twenty years, as opposed to I just killed him. You know, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I like when yeah, right. say, Sorry, big fella, too. Like, just oh yeah, acknowledging. Yeah. But I, I can appreciate that because that's the mentality of the character. Like, he's going to beat your ass, but he's also not out to really harm you either. It's, no, no, exactly. I, I like um, that though. I don't feel like it's that. I, that I feel like that. That's a that's a character trait uh, he man needs to maintain. And here comes that part that final piece she wanted to know and see. God, Thomas I love this whole sequence. Here. The music is so good here. I love where Zor just like looks down every once in a while. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's my child. Man, I was like, but you're a bird. <laughs> Don't ask questions. But it's, it's so simple. It's like so visually simple, but so beautiful at the same time. And now, and I, I don't want to say too much because I, I don't like break, but knowing that the sorceress, you know, shows up in her human form here, you know, it's it's one of those few occasions, but I feel like the logic behind it, you never would really question it because I almost feel like it's not, something that... It's going well, she's not allowed to, I'm like, I don't care if it breaks continuity, it's the, it's, it breaks continuity and creates like probably the best scene in the, in the cartoon. Because for me, I think I have said, it's a toss up between this and... Um, uh, the problem with power, as in the most kind of striking scenes in the series. Yeah, this yeah. one I think often winning because it is just so kind of you know plucking on the heartstrings. And that line at the end is just so, such a beautiful line. I've had lots of practice. Of course you have, Lima. You lie to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and also, what an epic ending! Like you know them, uh, you know him riding off into her flying away and him riding off. Her, her in the wind rider going. Where am I going? How did I get here? <laughs> It's a masterpiece. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it. I mean, I like when they, they did that top ten episode for the DVD before the actual like s seasons came out. It was, I was glad to see it was ranked so high by the fans. Like number one, I think it was on that top ten DVD. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it has to be. It is, it is still the episode. Like I said, it is one that just tra transcends the series. Every, every cartoon, I think, if you look hard enough, does have that one episode where you're like, well, this is, this is what I always. This is the definitive one. Not necessarily the one you always think of, but this is the one that. You could point someone to and be like, watch this. And I'd be like, oh, that's, that was amazing. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, a and it, it's like, Taylor's Quest has no right to be in a He-Man cartoon, in a cartoon called He-Man, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's a kid's cartoon. I mean, yeah, if that was done with live action actors, it would be winning, like, you know, BAFTA awards or Oscars or whatever, it, but because it is such a powerful piece of, television writing but guess what it's a kids cartoon so it's like oh yeah that was cute um but for the rest of us that have, have what sat through and watched that and been like that was amazing um just just for fun not to change the place i'm just going to send i'm not going to send this to joe because i don't want any spoilers but i'm just going to send tyler <clears throat> a little rough animation i did just to show him something from the return of faker and um he'll watch it and we'll, we'll okay. see his reaction to it when he comes back um, All right. Well, I was going to say, while you send that to him, I did want to acknowledge Adam Gabbard, Aaron Voorhees, and Sportimus who joined us, and JSP in the chat room while we were doing that. Thank you. And now, again, while he's getting sent that, for all of you, if you have any questions that you want to ask James or us, pop it up in the chat room now, and we'll get to them. But in the meantime, yes, you go ahead and send it off to Tyler, and we'll God, get his reaction. Awesome. Of... Oh, there you go. That's That's really cool. And I'll send I'll send you one more again. You know, keep these to yourself. I'll Yo, send no, you no, no, these are stay between you and me, bud. I don't share this with anybody. Okay. I mean, let me just. Uh... I, I'm honored that you have shared some of this stuff over over the, the last couple of years with me and Joe. So, um, yeah, I, I man, that, that was that was beautiful. Okay, let me uh, run that one, or I'm just finding another one to send you. I'm just basing based in uh, Tyler rough animation clips from um, Return of Faker. Just a couple of the actual ones. Again, nothing spoilery, but uh, just so you can see what's uh, what's going on. I mean, he man rips off Trap Jaw's jaw, Joe, but you know it's, yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't affect the <laughs> <story. laughs> Yeah, right. Um, what's that one? I just want to make sure I don't send you the wrong one or something. And you're like, oh, you just spoke the ending. <laughs> oh. 
I wouldn't be upset well, about that at all. Like I, I'm not Joe. He's gonna you know flip over the you know the table and podcast is over and you never see him again. <laughs> well, hey, I was gonna say well, yeah, exactly. Well, while you're saying that, Grimbot did want to mention one thing. Uh, he said to Febmon in the chat room said, "Adam's 18 in season one of Filmation. Teal has been portrayed as even uh." is older even later in battle cat flashback but yeah the, uh, so i guess uh well i guess the point was for everybody i thought at least that she was 16 and adam oh, was 16 oh, oh. well <laughs> he's going there he's flipping on oh, that too that's cool oh that's badass man <laughs> but at least they're not 16 oh, people yeah. so at least we know that oh, yeah so i can't look at any of the stuff that you're seeing i can't see any of the stuff oh you could if you weren't such a wiener about it <laughs> uh, it's like Jonah's oh, damn man. fucking not wanting to see anything. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, those those are what I just sent I were like just two little bits of the because uh, this isn't a spoiler. This is just a fact. The um the fight between Faker and He Man probably lasts for about God, I guess say like like five or six minutes. It's oh, we a got long... a good meaty fight then. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot goes into it. Um, it's not just like. There's, as you can see, stuff. It's happens. not like the shaping staff where it's stop. No, <laughs> it's not like. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a rock or two chucked, but uh, beyond that, it's um, it's a very physical. Because one thing I wanted is, is you you you're one thing about He-Man, like only fight when I'm asked, and each time it, the last time. So to to make an exciting fight between He-Man and Faker, it's like, what do I do? He's a robot, so He-Man's going to punch the shit out of him. As simple as that. That was my attitude. It's like because he's a robot, yeah, he can do a few things that he probably. See, I was I was wondering if you guys were going to do that because then there's been a whole lot of sequences of actual He-Man punching, you know, other characters. But he's punching objects and things. So I'm not. I was wondering if that's something you guys would use to incorporate in a one-on-one fisticuffs fight with Faker. Oh yeah, no, I mean there's 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 some. And like I said, I was watching a cartoon the other month, and I thought, oh, this might work for um. Excuse me for he man a fake and uh, yeah, it'll be the last thing I think do sound animates because it is quite a big sequence. But when it's in there, it'll be uh, it'll be worth it. And like I say, if we can get a few of those bits, like what I just sent you um, in the trailer, you put that in the trailer, and people are like, wait a second, that's very good, you know. And that's just the rough animation as well, Tom. That's just my god. Um, this this it sequence. looks so cool, man. I mean, I, I what I, what I'm watching, Joe, is just a snippet of the fight okay okay yeah. and it, it yeah because at first I, I i was i was like which one was which and i'm like oh, oh that's cool i like that's <laughs> yeah I, I can't wait yeah. to see that with the proper pink uh, 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 oh yeah with, uh, with all the chest colors. harness and everything oh some things is when i when i if i'm if i'm coloring something like i'll send a bunch to andrew kramer he'll color he's been coloring machine um i'll color some pieces myself when i color it's that's the funny thing as well i'm i'm sending like Andrew Kramer, he colors a lot of the stuff. There's certain things I'm not sending him because I don't want to spoil it for him as well. <laughs> but and I, well we, we're spoiled completely. We, we won't be able to ever enjoy this in terms of, wow, that was an amazing shock because we came up with it. You know? um, but uh, yeah, with regards to that, I was like, I want, I, want, I want Andrew Kramer to go colored most of this to sit down and go, oh, wow, and him to be surprised by it as well. So. Uh, are there moments yeah, this that, damn. You, that you two are really, really eager to see people's reaction to? Like certain moments, oh, yeah, scenes? I mean, like I said, there's, there's, there's definitely about four or five scenes in Act Two um, where I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sure PowerCon will do it again. But if they don't record the audience, I will because there's like to say four or five scenes in Act Two where people will, I think, gasp at least. Three times, definitely, where people were like, "Oh, there will be that," and um, yeah, given given the reactions when we showed when we showed Act One, uh, you know, a lot of the clapping and applause and the whooping and all that. Act Two, there will be a lot of like gasps and it'll be equal amounts of cheering. But yeah, and like I said, I think by the end, it sounds so arrogant, sad, but I think there do, will be do, do not even think about calling yourself that. Do you have? You know, you have earned every bit of praise that you've gotten over the years from the early days of the of the uh, episode review website to to today. So it is not arrogant to feel this way about something that's going to kick so much ass. You know, Thank people you. ought to be kissing your ass when all is said and <laughs> done. You and Deucin, Andrew, Yuka, everybody who's worked on this project, 
deserves the highest of praise. You you guys especially because you guys have really got the ball rolling. So uh, don't don't uh, I know I know you're humble you're a humble person too, but you dude you you should be proud as hell from just watching this little snippet here, Joe. It's just so bad. I'll watch it again here. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> All so right, well hey. Well, while you watch it, there's some questions for James, and here's oh, number yes. one. Yeah. Let's uh, kick in. Okay, the this one's from. There. Yeah, this is from Zentron. Zentron said, "Speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, would you ever do a Dungeons and Dragons crossover with Masters of the Universe?" Um, in what sense? Like, I'm trying to imagine what, like a an animated cartoon. Well, no, people... Yeah, but well, let's. I mean, he didn't specify. I'm assuming he meant animated cartoon. But hell, if he didn't, maybe he could have meant that or comic form. Is that something you would um, like to do in any kind of form? I don't. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, like I loved the Dungeon Dragons cartoon. It's a lot of my all time favorites. Um, uh, got to do. I worked on the DVDs many years ago. It was, it was a lot of fun. And like I said, one of my favorite cartoons. Lots of great Japanese animation by Toei. Um, but in terms of a crossover, I can't really, maybe it's my lack of imagination, I can't really see where the crossover would work. I think Dungeon Dragons... Unless somehow maybe, maybe, maybe you could say picture that Dungeon Master maybe opens a portal for some reason needs help from another dimension, and you could picture them going over into the world of Eternia, but Venger follows along, and maybe Venger would have to team up at one point with Skeletor, but of course want to overthrow him maybe. Some crazy, insane thing see, like this that. Is Joe, this is why you're not in charge of writing stories and crossovers here. <laughs> I would, say, I would say my only my only thing I would not have is I I wouldn't have the kids leave the realm because the whole point of them being on the realm is they're always going to be stranded there like purgatory whatever you want to call it so I'd I'd have the Eternian characters come to the realm um, because I think that that would be to that makes more sense to have Skeletor follow He Man there He Man gets I don't know after or, something or like start some kind of incantation with evil in spell and open up uh what was what was dungeon master's little mate with the sh was he like shadow demon i think it was shadow demon and it somehow oh, the one that went for venture yeah oh jesus christ that's what i mean and that's what sucked is when the kids got home and remember venture followed them but then threatened their world unless they came back and damn it they had to come back and to know that they had that last episode written out but didn't animate it like god damn that's what you should do you and Deuce, and go ahead and animate the last fucking episode of dungeons dragons that we should have got and that's what honestly that's what i was gonna say sorry i'm yeah popping in here i was like if you're gonna do anything just give it a proper ending that way joe can finally shut the hell up <laughs> yeah, you ain't kidding. God damn it. Those, they should have finally got home, but yeah, that would have been great. But all right, well, here's another one for you, James. Uh, Sportimus said, will James uh, be attending PowerCon this year? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, I have to. Otherwise, the return of Faker doesn't get shown. It's that, it's that simple. Okay. I, I mean, okay. I, I've been to, been to um, PowerCon every, every PowerCon. Like, Val uh, invites me over and everything as a guest and, uh, you know, talks me out and everything, gives me a table. Not sure why I'm going to be selling the table because I. It's the thing. I thought, oh, I'll I'll make it a return of Faker table, so I'd still I'll sell stuff from the return of Faker, like prints and maybe some drawings that I've done or uh, do some storyboards or something. And then I thought, you know, if I do that before pe people see the movie, as in that night at PowerCon, if people pick up something, there's a giant spoiler on it that I've ruined. The do you know what I mean? So I thought, it'd be very very. Well, can't you do like an like? Can't you do like a you know, a VHS cover print? You know, something like that, and sell that. Yeah, and I mean, not that, have that's spoiler because I know you said you were going to do something like that. Yeah, I mean, we've got like the materials, you know, to be able to do that because we always wanted to do. I think I said before, like a VHS looking DVD, or even record it to VHS and do a limited release for fun. But um, yeah, I, I mean, like a, a print of like a video VHS style could be done. Like that's the thing I could do prints like that, but I'd love to do more prints. But if I did certain ones, I'd be like, oh, I'm spoiling it now. I'm sure. I, don't get me wrong. There were ways around it. I'm sure I'd be fine. But I'd hate to say to people, come to my come back to my table on Sunday, and I'll have more merchandise <laughs> now that you've seen it. Um, here's that giant revealing shot, you know. But um, yeah, so I'll, uh, yeah, short answer. I'm a power con. <laughs> I have to be okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Now, Willis Wheeler had a question. Now, again, when you answer this question, this is something, like you said, it's your critique, your criticism. This is something to where it wouldn't be bashing so people wouldn't confuse stuff. This is just an honest question from him. He says, what would you change about the new she cartoon if you could? Hmm. Is there anything within that you change? So like I said, that's your critique, uh, your criticism. Uh, this is it. I think, like... Some people know, other people don't. Like, I, I didn't mind season. I didn't mind season one. I haven't seen season two yet, which kind of tells you 
I guess, would speak volumes to some degree. I'm like, oh, I must watch it, but I haven't yet. I mean, The Return of Faker does take up a lot of time. Also, I was out drinking until four in the morning last night, so I'm like, nah, there's other things to do in my life. I, I will at some point watch season two of She-Ra. Um, I enjoyed season one. Uh, I, I, I didn't think it was the most amazing thing. I, I think the one thing it lacked, um, as so many shows do, that tr like the 2002 Mike Young show did as well, they lack the heart. So they can do really new and exciting stories and have, oh, look at the, the story arcs and, and do all that. But without that heart and that, that fantasy, um, yeah. Oh, okay, the, the one thing I would change about the new cartoon from just from having seen the first season, bring back secret identity. I don't understand. Like, there's, there's, I understand, like, like you go back, you look at the cinematic Marvel films, and, you know, uh, Steve Rogers is Captain America. And when I grew up in the comics, Steve Rogers was always, you know, the secret identity of Captain America. I can understand why in the films they were like, we don't need to do that. He's, a, you know, a government agent. It seems pointless, you know. So I, I didn't mind that. By doing that in She-Ra, removing the ability to do the secret identity, you... I'm sure they had their reasons. I haven't spoken to anybody about the show uh, or worked on the show. Um, by removing the secret identity, you just lose so many story possibilities and you lose so many different character things. Like, if everybody knows she, like, the, one of the, yes, for all its criticism, in the original show, a door runs off, She Ra pops in. I, it, yeah, a oh, wood well, duh, of course she's She Ra. Doesn't work like that. But yeah, she goes off. But what that leads to is characters going, well, where's she gone? And where's she gone? And, you know, and the villains going, well, we got a door and now where's she? You, you create all these different character interactions and reactions. That's the important part. You, like, yeah, it, it just it gives you so many more possibilities. The other problem, uh, not to, I don't want to go into this, here's all the other things I would change, but another thing I didn't, uh, wasn't keen on, didn't like the lack of super, I wasn't keen on the fact that Shira didn't feel like her own character. She just felt, my friend Lee in America put it best, he said she feels like a, a computer projected image, like a hologram, like Jem. If you remember like in the 80s, even Jem felt different. The whole point of um, uh, Jem. She just feels like the same character with a different outfit, basically. It's just yeah, the same uh, character, different outfit. There's no, there's not even a sign of really super amazing strength. I understand that so much to where the part that irritates me is okay. Now everybody knows. This is a point I'll just bring up just really quickly. But I appreciate everything what you just said because that's respectful of what you said. But is when they would address Shira when she's Shira, like characters like Bo are calling her Adora. It yeah. annoys me. It's like, okay, what's the sense of this new character? If okay, we're not going to even call her this new character who she's supposed to be. Let's I still call I her Adora. Saw, I think I saw a trailer for season two a couple of weeks ago, and they and yeah, a Bo, Bo said Adora, and I was like, oh man, it's yeah. The other the other thing I would change, and this would probably be the last thing, is I really didn't like the the uh, use of um, Earth dialogue. Modern oh, vernacular, God. yeah. Modern yeah. vernacular, there you go. You're right. Yeah. I couldn't... When the one that got me, I mean, you know, it was in the first trailer we saw when Shira was like, or Dora was like, let's, let's do it. this. It wasn't uh -huh. just that wasn't too bad. It's like we can, you can throw that in. That's fine. It was when there was an episode where Glimmer said something about maybe I don't remember if the exact line, but these were the the word was in there where she was like, all I ever do is screw up or something, or I don't want to be a screw up in front of my mother. I was like, screw up. That's that's too, that's too... I that's know what you mean. Well, I hate it when she said she's grounded. Like, who the hell would say they're grounded, like, on a fantasy planet? Like, that, that's, that's Earth that, terminology. I, I just, agreed, but I think we we kind of got that thing to a degree in the Filmation series where Man at Arms would punish Orko, and there was that... I don't know if, you know, you have to clean your room for a month, and I, I know that's they were very Earth-based setups if you know what i mean without using that makes sense but i felt like the dialogue like clean your room i feel like you can get it because it's clean your room as opposed to ground it is is slang it's, yeah, it's yeah. like you know you're you you can't it's like saying oh cool man like when you know i just kind of felt like adam's portrayal in nyp was very earth-based i, I didn't yeah, oh, like yeah, that absolutely. yeah uh, i just the, the beauty for me of, of the filmation cartoons and even other fantasy shows is you want it to feel 
Well, one you want, I mean, they've, they've done very good in this, I think. What I really like about the show is they've made it feel like an alien world. That's the, the first thing you want to do is when you make a cartoon about another world, the problem Mike Young show, obviously you have Snake Mountain stuff, but Evergreen Forest was just the forest with yellow sky. Yeah. I'm thinking this is, I want the Evergreen Forest to be winding trees and twisted branches or like the fertile plains, the fertile plains, which were you know, very lush and grit. And you want that kind of thing. You want that environment. And so I think they've done a really good job in the Shira show is it feels like an alien world. And, you know, positive things about Shira show, because I don't want to crap on it completely. I do like, I'm not saying it's better than the old or anything like that. I'm saying I do like I, the, the character interactions between Adora, Glimmer and Bo. Yes, it was what it was, but I did like the way that they carried over. I, the best thing about that show, I thought, was Catra as a character. I thought Catra was probably the strongest character. Nothing like the original Catra, but she at least had a start, middle and an end. I was like, okay, I can, I, this, is, this is a progressive story, as in it progresses. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just came away going, it's not for me. And that's that's fine. It, you know, every cartoon doesn't have to be. But I would have liked to have seen something. The, the, the thing I said to do, Sam, I think a few people have echoed this. Not that I made it the official statement, but I don't see why it had to be a cartoon about She-Ra. It could have been, you know, Wonder Girl and the Defender yeah. of Pre something, whatever the planet. It doesn't have to be a She-Ra cartoon. You, the only reason, and I've. I don't have a problem with it. I understand why they did it. It's just like you didn't have to, which is okay. they're using the brand Shira to piggyback off of. It's like we'll we'll, we'll call it Shira, therefore. Um, yeah, I, I just think gotcha. it's, it's 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 one of those things. I I don't I don't think it's a, a bad bad show. Um, I like many aspects about it, but it's it. I'd say the Mike Young show grabbed me more because that was more what I was used to. Maybe it is a familiarity thing, but the Mike Young was at least going Prince Adam, He-Man, Skeletor, wasn't right. too keen on Kelder. The essentials been... are still there. They don't feel like yeah, it's drastically still... changed. Yeah. Like I said, the Mike Young show lacked heart, but what it lacked in heart, it made up for action. There was a lot of great yeah. action in the Mike Young show. Um, yeah. yeah, it's uh, the, the new show is what it is. Um, well, like I, I said, you gave your points. You didn't disrespect anything. You gave honest yeah, opinions, yeah. and you said your positives as well. So, I hope it finds an audience and people enjoy it because the, the truth of the matter is, and I think Val said this before, but there is there is truth in the statement that if this show does well, then what you will hopefully see is Mattel, not necessarily Mattel, because I think this is very much not their decision in terms of this new Shira show. We will see more them going. Well, if we're making money out of this, why don't we like let's go back and make some money off of the original stuff? So I, I I'm not going to say I know this for a fact. But I I did hear rumors they were looking into kind of branding the original Shira as like a Shira in itself. So you'd have the new Shira, or the the kids are getting now, almost like. The collector Shira and the collector's He Man. So they would still be trying to do stuff for the original stuff. And whether that be Return of Faker being made official or new stuff. <laughs> like you can look at the, um, for example, the, 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 the little golden books they're doing, right? Do yeah. the He Man. One. Yeah. What are they based on? Total filmation. Or, you know, yeah, I mean, the He Man one visually and the Shira one visually, very filmation. Like I think Castle Grace looks like it was um, one of the, I think like maybe the 2002 version, I forget. But, um, yeah, in terms of that, that's where they've gone. Well, okay, we could do we could do a little golden book based on the new Shira, but why don't we head back and pull from the past and do this? So they're still allowing creators to do that. I think they're still encouraging that. I think Val's been dropping hints that maybe something's going to happen at San Diego Comic Con, and maybe it's something we're going to be like, oh well. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I have no idea what that is. But yeah, I mean, well, we'll see how it goes. Definitely, yeah. we will. And uh, but thank you for that. And also, Sportiman said it was nice meeting you at PowerCon in 2018. So, mm -hmm. yeah, somebody that met you here in the chat room. Uh, let me scroll down a little. I got to try to do this slowly because there was a, I think, a lot that started popping up, and I don't want to pass that. Um, 
Let me see. Oh, gosh. Sorry about that. Hold on a second. When will the uh, – oh, never mind. We, we know that because Adam Gabbert was late to the chat room. He was wondering when the return of Faker was going to be shown. But we got that. But thank you for that, uh, Adam. Let me – Um. gosh. James. James. Okay. Adam did have one. So, James, do you have a favorite Masters of the Universe male and female character for the classics line? Oh, as in the, the toy line, the classics? Yeah, the toy line. Oh, man. Um, I would – Oh, that's, that's tricky because there's so many. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I did like what they, I loved, even though I didn't own them, I loved the figure for Scorpio. I thought the Scorpio okay. figure was phenomenal. When I, I never owned it. I remember because um, at that point, Mattel had stopped sending me free toys because I think they realized I wasn't Pixel Dan. They're like, this guy isn't reviewing things. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> okay. I just like owning them. I mean, they were great. It was, it was, it was a great toy line at, its, at the height of its popularity. But I didn't own um, I didn't own Scorpio, but I love that figure. It was so detailed and intricate. Uh, in terms of, I still think you can't beat the. I mean, Trapjaw as a character, I've always loved his design, and that classics Trapjaw is so awesome. I'm looking at it on my shelf because I've got so I sold a lot of my classics toy line um, many years ago, and the only ones I kept were, as I always call them, the Diamond Ray crew. So like Beastman, Merman, Evil in. Triclops and Trapjaw. I kept Battleground Evil then because she had the um, 2002 color scheme. Uh -huh. She was really good next to the yellow skinned Evil then. Uh, but yeah, uh -huh. I think Trapjaw probably my favorite uh, classics uh, male. And um, I'd say Scorpio, even though I didn't own her, was such a good. She's figure. awesome. Especially her face is very okay. striking. It's very. Um... Yeah, they got the whole filmation look really, yeah. really well. I'm looking on your shelf behind you to see if I can see any classic. Oh, she's figures. right here. She's right there. She actually broke in half. I don't know how the hell it happened. She broke in half. Yeah. Oh. Like in, yeah. See, I don't know how it happened, but it like her torso just severed one day. Oh crap. So but uh just another close up how striking that face is. Yeah, look at that, man. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah I so I I had her in a more, more prominent spot because I liked the character a lot, but because of what Tyler, happened. Tyler. Yeah. Can I see your torso, the, both parts of the broken part, and put them up to the camera and talk? I want to oh, see both oh, uh, God. ends of now that. I'm going to make sure I pluck her legs out without knocking the whole horde down. So it's like, <laughs> boom. Like, thanks, Joe. You just broke eight more figures, you prick. Uh, <laughs> hang on. Wouldn't hang that on. suck? Oh, God. I hope I don't cause a disaster. Uh, it's just Chad, I want to see Chad if I can. going to fall over here. Sorry. Uh, oh, I just hit because I got her tail hooked. On, on... <laughs> don't do it. Oh, well, okay. never mind. Right. I, got I got it. I got it. Okay. And then talk right. so I could see up close. All right. Well, like I said, the interior right there, it just severed. I had, It didn't fall off the shelf. I don't know how it happened. It just, I was cleaning the shelf one day. I picked her up and it just fell apart. So. All right. And, and then the other part, let me see her other end where it was broke on the other part of her body. Yeah. It's just severed. Well, if you want, you could send her to me and I can at least make it to where she will stay together. I can, uh, I can fix that for you. Now I do that for free. You're sure there wouldn't be no hidden charge or uh Joe, uh, Joe wait, 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 wait. Joe said he would do that. Free? Uh, I use the wow. F word. I use the F word. I've never yeah, said free yeah, in my the, life. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's for me. The the only F word that Joe never uses. <laughs> <laughs> like I guess I could send Joe like a box of protein bars because I'm not sending I'm not sending some junk food shit. You know? Yeah, you could yes, he, yeah, he, would, he wouldn't eat that though. He would just like Throw that in I the mean, dumpster and then like dig for other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but no, you could send it to me, Tyler. I'll fix. I'll fix her up for you. All right, all right. Um, I'll have to do okay. that because I, I I love this figure a lot. She's definitely the best looking female of the whole horde. So I yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll make it to where she could stay together and hopefully pose. I I will. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix her up for you. Okay. Well, feel free <laughs> but, to send like a customized black star while you're at it. <laughs> hey, there you go. There you go. The, um, let's see. Sportimus said. Uh, James, will you be? Oh, I don't know if he meant. I don't think he means at PowerCon. Maybe he just means in general. But says, will you do drawings for people of Masters of the Universe characters? So I guess basically saying is, do you do commissions? Do you do drawings? Of, oh, yeah, I mean, if I'm somebody not, said, hey, I don't advertise that I do, but like when I've been at conventions, I draw stuff for people, and yeah, I'm, okay. I'm always happy to. I can I can draw with some relative competence. I wouldn't say I'm the uh, I'm like a. Uh, and maybe I'll know Santa Lucia or anything like that, but uh, I can I can whip up something. Yeah, you know, just just message me on Facebook or something. Okay, all right. Well, that sounds cool. Well, thank you for that, Sportimus, and thank you for that, James. Um, Grim said, uh, 
he said, uh, James, show your Rocky Dennis look. Is there something that you do that he knows what's up? What's he oh, wow. No, he, I, that's in reference to me because they were like, turn the camera on because I guess I, oh, he thinks I look like Rocky Dennis. What the hell? What? Turn on your camera. You don't look like Rocky Dennis. Put this on. Okay, join us now, Nathan. Wouldn't it be it. great, though, if I had like the like the mask from Mask? Oh, maybe it's because you're, maybe it's the, uh, your curly hair because Rocky Dennis has curly hair. I don't hair. know. That's, that's really about it's it. It's probably my big forehead. That's fine. I'm all right with it. I look at pictures when I was a kid and I was like, yeah, damn, that's, yeah. <laughs> you got a big forehead. So it makes sense. It's fine. I want to say too, I, uh, I appreciate James and uh, drinking till 4am. Cheers to you, sir. Oh no, it was, it was a heavy night. My, my friend's 30. If even though I'm 42, I've got a lot of young friends for some reason. And uh, she, uh, yeah, it started at eight in the evening and we, yeah, we drank until four. No, sorry. 3 a.m. and then I got home at 5 a.m. So and then I had I got home at 5 a.m. and had like a McDonald's on my way home. As you yeah, do. yeah. Um, what you McDonald's, do. he's the man. There you go. I love oh, you. I mean, too. Joe, that like it, it's it's one of the few things that would be open at this time. Exactly. Yeah. Like we got. Tw- yeah. I've got a 24 hour one. Like about a seven minute walk from my house. I was just like, oh, this will do. And um, but yeah, I, I have a, a weird superpower because I didn't start drinking alcohol till I was 31. So before then, I'd go out and just always be, I always say doing Coke and everybody thinks, oh, my God. And I was like, no, 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 Coca-Cola. <laughs> and I worked in an industry where I did see a lot of cocaine. So I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I went to parties and it was all on the table. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not that person. Uh, so I worked in the industry, but I would always be the guy that would be sober the entire night. But the guy who would be like, let's go at karaoke. Let's dance. Let's do this. Let's do that. So I was a really bad influence. And um, and then I got to 31. I was like, my, one of my friends, she was like, try try cider. I was like, really? I was like, I don't like any alcohol. It tastes foul. She said, no, cider's good. It's got like a sweet taste to it. No, no, no. I was like, oh, this is really nice. And we spent the rest of the night drinking. I was like, oh, wow. Okay, that's what that is. Um, so because I started drinking so late, I can, I can mix my drinks like crazy. So last night I was doing uh, Prosecco, like wine, cocktails. Uh, I had a beer. Um, yeah, just mix it up. Gin and tonic is my, my current drink of choice. Mix it up. And then I wake up with no hangover. I, I, I don't do hangovers, which is really, which really people hate uh, because I'm like, oh, what are we doing now? And it was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's my weird sleeper parents. Like, I don't get hangovers for some reason. All right. Well, uh, I will have to find a way to drink together sometime. Then. Hey, there you go. <laughs> well, hopefully God, we can make it out to PowerCon, if not this year, definitely next year. And yeah, I mean, I yeah. think Val said 2020, he wants to make 2020 like the big, big one, which which kind of sucks because I was like, oh, man, the return of Faker should be at the big, big one. But I could always show it again, <laughs> have like a second viewing. Or do, yeah, do it like, or do like a, a special edition, incorporate, you know, Lizard Man into this one scene here. You there know, you go. Yeah, like we that. bring yeah. Lizard Man into it, Clank Champ, get Gwildor in there as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there yeah. you go. All of them, all, all three of them in there, just, just standing there, waving at the camera. Just, just hanging out, you know, yeah. Oh, that, that would be, oh that'd be, yeah, I am so there. I'll, I'll buy my ticket right now, Val. <laughs> All right, well, James, we got one more question for you because I was going to say, man, this has been our longest episode ever. And I, uh, yeah, we got one Joe's more. got to get to McDonald's. <laughs> That's right. You got me all hungry, all this food. Uh, Willis Wheeler said, what 80s toy line has had the best luck stain in the stores in your eyes over the years? Oh, a Transformers. Without hesitation, Transformers. That, at least in the UK, because I think in America, you guys, I think you had Transformers up until like Headmasters, and maybe there was all the kind of Action Masters and Target Masters and all that crap. But when when the toy line ended in America, and then you got it rebooted as... Um, With Beast Wars. No, before Beast Wars, they, were, they rebranded the original one, Transformers... Um, generation two oh, okay and, see I, that's why I, I always associate one and two it's kind of running together and then when beast wars comes along that's when i that that's that's in my mind yeah but, oh, no, no, right. yeah. but no there was there was a delay of about i think about three or four years in between the end of transformers like headmasters on the toy shelf so all those toys associated with that and generation two where they suddenly put you know they gave all the bright colors of megatron was a tank remember that yeah that was when yep. the tank megatron came um but in the UK, in between those years, they started re-releasing the original Transformers toys in gold boxes and calling them like Transformers Classics. So in the UK, I think it's feasible. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. 
that Transformers has, and I, I mean, even across the world, Transformers has never really been off the toy shelf since 1984. Yeah. It's always been a presence. Yeah. You know, those god awful movies are what they are. Mm. But they kept it going. Like, the, the, they made Hasbro billions of dollars um, whilst they are atrocious. Um, I was telling someone the other day about it. They were, they, was, they were talking about something about Transformers. I said, oh, God. I said, you don't want to see the film. Uh, I remember when I realized, oh, my God, the Constructicons, they're going to turn into Devastator. And the first thing you see is just a pair of giant wrecking balls oh, as tentacles. Yeah. And it was just like, what the hell? Mm. So that was the last Transformers movie I saw. I was like, yeah, I don't need to see any more of these. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, they, that, that toy line just, and they've made so many cartoons. Um, I'm not saying they're all particularly good, but they've, they've kept it going. So I think it would be that and then Ninja Turtles, those two brands just clicked. And they, because I think, especially Transformers, because they're kind of robots and Ninja Turtles. I mean, He-Man as well, they're all timeless, but for some reason, those two brands have just gone from generation to generation. They're I just wish Mattel them. had that, that mentality. Like, with Transformers, yeah. are, this one doesn't work, try this one. And with Playmates, try this version of Turtles. Like, with He-Man, they're just, oh, well, that one stunk, so we, we ain't going to go back and do that again. I just, the lack of I mean, faith in something that made so much money at one point, I just... You know. But that's the thing, like, I look at something like Turtles, and I, I love the original series. I'm not too keen on when they went to, like, season four and five. And oh, no, yeah. When it went Raphael through, meets yeah. the music man or whatever, all this bullshit. I was like, no, no, keep me the first three seasons. You, you're, what, you're, we're, we're in the same boat, all of us are. Yeah, yeah, when the Technodrome's under the earth, that's where it's the last good season. And then after that, I'm like, I'm good. Um, but uh, with Turtles, so I look at that, and I, I love that. And the 2002 Turtles was a really good show for my, so I didn't see all of it. Really good show. Ever since then, the Turtles, I'm like, I've no interest in this cartoon or toy line or brand. It's probably, if we're talking about the success of toy lines, it should be the same with She-Ra. We, we should probably be seeing cartoons and toy lines that were like, nah, this isn't for us because we've still got the original Turtles, the original Transformers, the original um, He-Man and She-Ra. So... I'm, that's why I guess I'm not too fussed when you get all these new versions. I don't agree with them, but if it keeps it going, if if only we could have had the success that Transformers and Ninja Turtles get, you know, that would have been nice. Yeah. But for some reason, yeah, He-Man and she But at the same time, I love telling people, um, as I, I always say, you know, even with the He-Man 2002 cartoon, I'd, I always say, oh, my He-Man and she happened in the 80s, and I'm so thankful for that. I, I got this great cartoon, amazing toy line that's to this day, you still discover stuff about about the cartoon, about like they released that as a toy. Joe's always popping up with photos of stuff. You're like, they made that, you know, all those <laughs> uh, bubble bath things you own. Are they bubble bath? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They, 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 those things, it's like, okay, He Man and Skeletor. Yeah, duh. Of course they made those. But then you pop up with all these other ones. It's like, what? They made those? Yeah. And yeah, they made so many bits of merchandise and, and yeah. crazy comics. With Speaking of one quick one from Spike, uh, James, how is the animation going on yours and Grimbot's new adaptation of the Chinese Masters comics? Oh, my God. When, when we talked earlier about doing the uh, Masters of Space, I did think, yeah, wouldn't it be great to turn that, like, Zodak in his car with... Uh, my God. Thunder. I mean, you know, those other, like, those other Chinese comics, you could tell they basically <laughs> were trying to draw... Filmation into this comic, but this is one unique one. I was like, what in the hell is going on? Everybody's got this insane design. We don't know what's happening, but it's that the is best. the craziest every thing. Time, every time Spike posts a panel from it, it just gets more, it gets more and more absurd. Yeah, like, well, there's nothing that can surprise us now. Like my favorite one was one of the ones where it's like a shot of Hordak from far away with his like arm cannon raised. Okay, and he goes. Who do you think this is? Like, it's clearly Hordak. And then in the close-up, he's the general with, like, the moustaches. <laughs> what the hell is this? It was – that was some ugly – God, you the couldn't Hondor, tell, but – Condor, Zodak, Orko, and Cringer in the car. That That's such a t-shirt. Gold. That's not such an iconic image because it's so fucking absurd. So how it is. is. Who, I couldn't even – if you gave me all the best drugs in the world, like, come up with something, people like, okay um, – that would be so far remote. I wouldn't be able to do that because that I, is some. Trippy. I hope all all of this stuff finds its way into the new film. That's what I want. Yes. Oh my god! If we got Plunder in a new live action movie, you know that'd be great. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Well, well, James. Before we wrap it up, and I tell everybody what to do, 
why don't you tell here everybody that's listening, you know, live right now or eventually later, where they can go, where they you know can contact you, and if you got anything going on. Um, let me think. So yeah, currently working on the return of Faker. Um, what else? Uh, I've got any books I'm working on, I don't think. Um, but yeah, you can find me uh, these days. I tend to frequent Instagram more than anywhere. So I'm uh, at Serial Geek, as in breakfast cereal, Serial Geek 77 on Instagram, because someone else took Serial Geek. Damn them. Huh. So I'm at Serial Geek 77 on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, James E. Talk. I, my, all my stuff's public posts. So I, when people go, oh, can you friend request me? I'm like, you can see all my stuff anyway. <laughs> um, where else? Uh, I've got a website, which is, yeah, hemanshirashop.com, uh, which I need to pimp more. I haven't promoted that in a long time. Uh, yeah, that's about it, really. Nathan, you can uh, add that on the... Um, our... Well, we'll do. Well, I mean, I, I'm just uh, uh, admiring things that have happened and transpired in the chat tonight. It's been yeah. I want to acknowledge. Uh, Salik goes live in the chat room. Said, "Masters of the Universe is for nerds." Man, yeah, you got it. Yeah, I, you, I agree. Yeah, you nailed it, man. Hot damn. You agreed, got it. Agreed. Agreed. You got it. I am just the. Yep, you got it. So, um, but now I want to say we appreciate everybody that was listening live. Hope you enjoyed this episode. For anybody new to the channel, make sure you like, subscribe. Share and ring that bell so you always get notified when we go live. James, it was an honor again. We got to have you back again, especially when Return of Faker comes on and you finally premiere that sucker, maybe in the final, the week after that. Whenever you have time, you have to come back on and talk about that and anything oh, else. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. All right. So, okay, guys. So, until next time, have a powerful day. Well, it certainly took you long enough to get here. No thanks to your bad magic. That, James, that, you got that one? I, I, I know what it is. Guys, I know. Don't I, say that. I know this one. This is It <laughs> Takes Two with Steve Gutenberg and the Olsen <laughs> Twins. You know that damn thing. Cut there. Christ. James, do you have a clue what he's talking about? Um, no thanks to your bad magic. It's definitely a skeletal line. No thanks to your bad magic. Is it? Oh, I can't, that one's escaping me. It's two lines. Hit. You well, it certainly took you long enough to get here. No thanks to your bad magic. Oh no, you're right. Yeah. Oh no, that's gonna kill me if I don't get it. That's really on the tip of my tongue. Can I stump the e talk? Wait, wait, this wait, would wait. be terrible because oh, don't don't get stumped, James. You can't have this no, shit happen. I, I I I could claim top of the mountain in terms of like you know he man trivia here. If I stump James here like on the podcast <laughs> for everybody, you do us, you do become the top of the of the, of the mountain. Um, I le at least like to think I could go like an, a a good like you know one on two handicap match with James and Deuce. And I would lose, but gracefully, where that, that guy's got talent. <laughs> what is it? Um, oh, it's only took you long enough to get here. No thanks to your bad magic. I can hear the delivery and I can I can hear the pacing of it. My brain's just not connecting. I've got too much Return of Faker dialogue up there now. <laughs> if it's not the Return of Faker, I don't know anymore. Um, no thanks to your bad magic. Oh, Azrog Spider. Return of Orko's God, uncle. man. Ah, I really yeah, thought I you're so not, the, you're to not the top of the mountain. <laughs> Suck it, Tyler. Suck it. I had three quotes in that episode. I'm going to throw one at him just to see if, like, if he does he know that oh, episode man. as much as I know it. I was just like, uh, I can't that was go to his voice, but yeah, oh wow. Okay, that that is oddly satisfying and a perfect <laughs> way to end the show. Uh, hey, if it plugs that episode even more, then great. I, I, I will sacrifice, you know, my, my, my championship belt to James. There, so. <laughs> you never you yeah. never had one. James oh, is the champion. I made my own belt. It looks like the hardcore title. It's a piece of shit. Oh, you know, great. Like, you know, great. Taped on it. Yeah, you're yeah. like you're like Taz. You're like, yeah, I can't do this, so I gotta make my own belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks See a lot, guys. Yep. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>